couple of days ago, um, I was watching television and noticed I get up a urinate about six, seven, eight times in less than an hour. I don't know why I had a feeling the news would be bad, as I had not prepared mentally for bad news. In 2018, when I was when I was told I had cancer, it was like a whirlwind of emotions going through my body. Quite matter-of-factly, the doctor said, well, it is cancer. I think I blinked and then I went right into robot mode. But then I go to Dr. Locker. And then when I go to Dr. Locker, he explained to me what's wrong or what's wrong. Or what's wrong. I met with my oncologist and he graciously spent the time with us explaining what was found. And although it was helpful, it did not manage any of the fear factor. I was numb. My body shook uncontrollably. Even death came to mind. Well, um, I wasn't, I wasn't scared. scared. So many things come to play. Your family, your home, your work, your friends, your life. You're floundering, and the fear factor is real. My sister who was with me says I took it well and that I asked intelligent questions. But to this day, I don't remember much of what he said to me as I had completely shut down. I then started preparing myself spiritually and emotionally to face whatever it took to survive. The voices you just heard are persons who live with non-communicable diseases. They need to be at the center of our solution building. Recording in progress. Another voice that needs to be considered is that of youth given that every decision we make affects their current and future circumstances. Hello, my name is Ricardo Jean. I'm a first year AUA medical student. And I believe as a future physician that the youth voice is critical in shaping our health systems. So AUA partnered with Healthy Caribbean Coalition and its youth arm, Healthy Caribbean Youth, Mental Health Talk Antigua, and let's unpack all of which our Caribbean civil society organizations are continuously advocating for improved mental health of children and youth to release a youth report poll to better understand the knowledge and perspectives of the youth, youth on the issues that we will be discussing today during this symposium. Nearly 2,000 people, mostly between the ages of 15 and 19, responded to the poll across the organizations of Eastern Caribbean states, Barbados, and Trinidad and Tobago. Here is their story based on the poll results. Most young people in the Caribbean are very worried that non-communicable diseases, uh, such as uh, alcohol and marijuana, are incredibly harmful to the heart and the brain. However, there are some who disagreed that with these harms, um, which highlights the need for ongoing comprehensive interventions that highlight the risk factors for non-communicable diseases, especially among young people. The youth did appreciate that climate change will have an impact on their ability to access food, rightfully noting that droughts, floods, changes in temperature will have an impact on crops and livestock. Beyond access to food, most of the youth strongly agree or somewhat agree that climate change can contribute to the development of health conditions. There were some, however, who responded neutrally, which indicates an ongoing need to highlight the intersecting implications of climate change and ensure that young people continue to be a part of the solution building. So when asked about mental health services, the youth provided some critical insight to guide us in creating environments that best support their mental health. Firstly, 49% of the youth indicated that they have access to services through their school or community, with most indicating that they had not visited a mental health professional. However, 23% said that although they didn't visit, they wanted to. The top three challenges associated with accessing mental health services are one, the social stigma and negative perception, two, privacy concerns, and lastly, difficulty accessing services. These challenges need to be considered in refining our mental health. Our mental health services in order to support our youth. In terms of broader mental health advocacy efforts, the youth recommended mental health awareness campaigns, 
peer-to-peer -peer support programs, and after-school programs. These recommendations align with the Caribbean Youth Mental Health Call to Action that was released by Healthy Caribbean Coalition Youth Arm, the Healthy Caribbean Youth. Please feel free to scan the QR code to see the results for yourself. You need, the youth need to be critical in uh, representing and solution building. Mrs. Sobers, back to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. We are currently going to get into the gist of the entire meeting. Just give me one second. All right. So this morning we are doing, uh, this morning it's going to be mental health and solutions for reducing non-communicable diseases in the Caribbean. So we've just heard voices of the Caribbean people and we're going to go on to our presenters. So we have uh, myself, Verne Sobers. Good morning again, everyone. I am a criminologist and forensic psychologist. We also have with us uh, Dr. Leslie Walwyn, who's the Associate Dean of Global Health and the lead, the lead organizer. We have Dr. Joan Brathwaite, psychiatrist in Barbados. We also have Dr. Kim Bella Scott, that's physician and trauma resiliency specialist. We have Daniel Walwyn, who is a physical activity advocate. And then we have Dr. Stanley Lauta, he is the health economist at, he is a health economist at the UWI. The objectives this morning uh, to describe the burden of non-communicable diseases, in, including mental health conditions in the Caribbean and underlying, and underlying causes, to identify factors that increase the risk of mental health illness, other NCDs and their risk factors in the Caribbean, to uh, identify the factors that the risk of, sorry, to identify factors that increase the risk of mental health illness, other NCDs and their risk factors in the Caribbean, to examine the mental health NCD uh, services in the Caribbean, as well as the their utilization and treatment gaps, to identify uh, solutions to promote mental health and close the treatment gap as a part of the overall plan to reduce all NCDs in the Caribbean and achieve SDG 3.4. All right. So I just wanna tap back a second um, with our presenters. Um, like I said, I'm, today, I'm the moderator for today's session. And I introduced, I introduced uh, our colleagues today. And then we're also gonna have first uh, and second year medical students from AUACOM as well. All right. So we have here um, non-communicable diseases, are NCDs. So what are NCDs? Non-communicable diseases, also known as chronic diseases, are medical conditions that are associated with long durations and slow progress. Heart disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, lower respiratory tract diseases, mental health disorders, and neurological conditions are the leading NCDs globally. The Caribbean is absolutely no different. Most entities are preventable through healthy lifestyles. So allow me to give a brief uh, history or tell you a little bit of our Caribbean. The Caribbean has 26 main inhabited islands, including 13 sovereign states, all with similar histories of colonialism, where slaves and indentured laborers uh, toiled to meet great demands for sugar. Centuries of wealth extraction contributed to the huge economic success of Britain, Europe, and North America. 
sugarcane fueled the industrial age and provided rum for the laborers. Even though emancipation was almost 200 years ago, life continued for another century until it was no longer financially feasible to keep these colonies and they were granted independence. The islands had minimal infrastructure and no immediate means of thriving. Most islands turned to tourism to build their economies. Like other small island developing states are SIDS, Caribbean countries have limited resources and shared vulnerabilities to food security and the effects of climate change. For countries vary in topography, levels of economic development, disparities of wealth and social stability. For perspective, we may occasionally compare four island states during our presentations. That's Antigua, Grenada, Haiti, and Jamaica. Jamaica and Grenada are, main, are mountainous and considered to be upper middle income countries. Antigua is a an high income country and Haiti is a low income country and the poorest in the Western hemisphere. All countries throughout the Caribbean, however, have a heavy disease burden of NCDs. To examine the impact of NCDs in the Caribbean, Dr. Leslie Walwyn and her students, Tia Diaz, Tia Diaz and Ted Pais, Tiva Siva Kalundu and Leonardo Santiago will join us now. Dr. Walwyn, like I mentioned before, is the Associate Dean for Global Health at AUACOM and has been heavily involved in NCD prevention and control in her country. Dr. Walwyn, over to you. Sorry, I muted. Thank you, Mr. Sobers. Globally, NCDs accounted for approximately 74% of deaths each year. In 2000, it was 60%. In the Americas, of which the Caribbean is a part, this number is a whopping 80%, where four out of five persons are going to die from an NCD, which is well above the world average. In the subregion of Latin America, 77% of persons will die from an NCD. For the past 40 years, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and lower respiratory tract diseases have been the leading culprits globally. Within the past decade, however, mental health and neurological disorders have gained recognition by the World Health Organization as the fifth leading cause in the forms of dementia, substance use disorders, and neurological disorders. Although about three out of four Caribbean people die from an NCD compared to rest of the Amer Americas, when you look at age, Caribbean people are dying younger and in greater proportions. Just how much of us are going to die before our 70th birthday from an NCD will depend on which island we reside in, as the proportion of premature mortality varies between islands. This slide gives an appreciation of which NCDs contributed to death in 2020-12 in the Caribbean and demonstrates the impact of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and lung disease and the stats shown here do not consider mental health and neurological conditions because data in this age group was not collected then with reference to this, and it's still hard for us to come by. When we consider the cause of death in age groups or the age adjusted mortality rate, the non-Latin Caribbean outshines all of its neighbors. Of course, that's those of us in the English speaking Caribbean. Here we show the countries in the Americas and their ranking for premature mortality due to NCD from the highest proportion down to the lowest. Leading the pack with nearly 60% of persons dying before age 70 is Guyana, Haiti is second. Antigua and Barbuda are in fifth place with an alarming 45% of persons who will not live to see their 70th birthday. Four other Caribbean nations are well above the average for premature mortality in the Americas. Grenada and Jamaica fall below the average of 39%, and Barbados is lowest in the Caribbean with only 28%, but then Caribbean people, according to Barbadians, are still sicker, but living longer. And they are just above that for Canada. In comparing our hand-picked islands, we see that despite NCDs, 
despite income, NCDs still bring too many of us to an untimely death. Although the goal, although the goal for 2025 is to reduce premature mortality due to NCD by 25%, Antigua and Barbuda and Haiti and other islands are on the increase despite government commitment. Grenada, although struggling with its male population, is overall on the decline. And Jamaica is making slow but steady progress, but none of the islands are on target. When we're looking at premature mortality rates, closer still, the islands vary in their challenges, but all Caribbean countries are above the region's average for death due to cardiovascular disease. Grenada carries the highest mortality in the entire Americas due to cancer. All Caribbean islands fall well above the region's average. In fact, we double it for death due to diabetes. Haiti and Guyana are above the region's average for lower respiratory tract diseases. And although we don't have data captured yet on substance use and dementia, death by suicide was measured. Guyana, Trinidad, and Haiti are well above the region's average. Now that we have an appreciation of how much NCDs contribute to mortality and early mortality, let us now consider how many persons actually live with NCDs in the Caribbean. The management of NCDs is costly. Diabetes and hypertension alone count for 7% of the gross domestic product in the Caribbean. Caribbean people are living longer and the risk of acquiring any NCD increases with age. This burden, this absolutely burdens the social security systems in our region. And it's been estimated that dementia costs the Caribbean $3.6 billion in direct, indirect and informal medical costs in 2015 and that measured as approximately 9,000 US dollars per person that year. This busy caption shows the amount of disability adjusted life years or years living with cardiovascular disease per 100,000 persons. It's a good reflection of disease burden. Haiti leads our islands on the extreme left. Grenada falls into fourth place. Both countries have a high proportion of death due to ischemic heart disease. And then second in line is strokes. All right, and this is the same throughout the Caribbean region. High blood pressure is the greatest contributor to the disability adjusted life years that we mentioned before. It is highly prevalent in the Caribbean. Of course, it outranks the rest of the Americas average. In Haiti and Grenada, just one in four adults have elevated blood pressure. In Jamaica and Antigua, it's estimated as about one in five adults. According to the Caribbean Research and Public Health Agency, cancer is the leading, second leading cause of death in Caribbean, in Caribbean people, accounting for one fifth of all deaths. In 2020, over 100,000 estimated new cases of cancer were found in the Caribbean, with female breasts leading the pack with 15%. Lung, prostate, colorectal cancer, and stomach cancers are also common. The Caribbean has the fastest incidence of diabetes in the world, the fastest growing incidence, and this represents a public health crisis. Acquiring diabetes is linked to the interaction of inherited genes with the environment, and it includes other parts of the environment, such as unhealthy diets and physical inactivity. A review by Guillardo Risson et al. estimated that 20% of Latin America and Caribbean women have gestational diabetes which leads on to diabetes for the mother later on in her life and increased risk of diabetes for her offspring when they achieve adulthood. This, along with growing obesity in the region, are listed as reasons as for why the past three decades have seen an explosion of diabetes. That same paper suggests that 50% of persons living with diabetes don't have adequate blood sugar control and 30% of persons with diabetes haven't yet even been diagnosed. Asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are two of the most common causes of lung diseases globally. Childhood asthma is on the increase globally, but Latin America and the Caribbean have the highest prevalence, contributing to 500 disability adjusted life years in the first year of life alone. Pollution, urbanization, and pollen play a role. Childhood obesity is also linked to asthma and may contribute somewhat to the increasing number of cases being seen. Looking at the Caribbean, in Jamaica and Antigua, one quarter of children under the age of five have asthma. In Grenada and Haiti, one fifth of children in the same age group have it. Although data is lacking on the prevalence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a systemic review done by Rodriguez in 2022 concluded that the prevalence 
of this condition is 8.9% in persons over age 35 in Latin America and the Caribbean. Of course, this is linked to tobacco, air pollution, and work exposure. Depression and anxiety are extremely common in the Caribbean with an estimated 25% prevalence. Of course, the pandemic likely increased that incidence. Multiple studies have, done, have been done and show that Afro-Caribbean populations have demonstrated a statistically significant relationship between depressive disorders and non-communicable diseases. A study of over 1,200 Afro-Caribbean persons showed that persons living with cardiovascular disease, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and COPD had statistically significantly higher rates of depression. Hypertension is high in persons living with mental illness in the general population in Afro-Caribbean persons. This was found in Curacao. Diabetes prevalence is higher in women with mental illness in the general population. And Caribbean women with type 2 diabetes are 10% more likely to experience depression than their male counterparts. We know that substance use is greater in Caribbean persons living with mental health disorders. Little, dis little data is available on the incidence of dementia in the Caribbean, but Cuba actually described an incidence of 10 per 10,000 persons. And now I invite Tia to tell us more about risk factors. Okay. The impact of non-communicable diseases on lives in the Caribbean is staggering. To change our trajectory, clearly we need to address the underlying causes. The World Health Organization identified five leading risks for NCDs, an unhealthy diet, tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and air pollution. Poor mental health may actually have a multiplier effect on NCD expression. The first four risk factors are based on behaviors. Behaviors can be modified. All risk will require individual, governmental, and all of society's investment. Complex factors influence the individual's ability to reduce their risk for NCDs. These include genetic factors and inherited risk, behavioral factors and willingness to change, and complex multi-layered environmental factors. Access to healthy food choices will be influenced by local food production and the quality and cost of imported foods. Access to safe spaces will influence physical activity. Access to holistic healthcare, including adequate prevention and treatment services is critical. On a, society, on a societal scale, economic, political and social stability affect businesses and homes. External shocks like extreme weather events and pandemics will adversely affect economic stability as we have all seen too well. Laws and policies can have very impactful consequences to affect health. Let us explore risk from conception. From conception to age two years, these first 1000 days are critical for molding the child's dietary behavior and risk for NCDs. It is also when the baby's gut microbiome, the millions of bacteria that naturally live in the gut of humans is developed. The gut microbiome is important for immune regulation, synthesizing vitamins and other metabolites, and preserving good physical and mental health. Factors that influence the gut microbiome from birth include mode of delivery and breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is known to have remarkable benefits. It is linked to academic success. Breastfed babies are also more likely to have higher paying jobs than non-breastfed babies when they grow up, making breastfeeding a way to build national economies. In Antigua and Barbuda, nearly 100% of mothers are breastfeeding exclusively when they leave the national hospital with their newborn baby. But by six weeks, this drops to only 30%. Dietary choices influence the composition and function of the gut microbiome. Research has shown that diets low in fiber, vegetables and fruits, but high in processed foods and red meats are triggers for weight gain, and persons with this unhealthy diet have unhealthy microbes. Unhealthy gut microbiomes may trigger inflammatory conditions, including diabetes and heart disease. The converse is also true. Eating a healthy diet high in fiber, fruits and vegetables, but low in ultra-processed foods and red meats are protective. Research is also showing that there is a connection between the soil microbiome, the food it produces that we consume, and the gut microbiome. Current industrial agricultural practices of monocrop cultivation will with heavy use of fertilizers, 
pesticides, and herbicides are contributing to degradation of the soil microbiome, loss of biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions, and environmental degradation will limit diversity of the healthy microorganisms. From our Caribbean historical perspective, slave-based sugarcane production replaced natural fauna and flora with this monocrop. We are now seeing the repercussions of this play out in poor human and environmental health in present day. There was a movement, however, to reprioritize soil health with regenerative organic agricultural practices that work with rather than against nature. Let us look deeper at food consumption patterns in the Caribbean. Most islands cannot produce foods to suit the needs of their population. Antigua Barbuda is almost completely dependent on importation. The region under consumes fruits and vegetables. Food security has worsened throughout the region due to increasing prices of food and scarcity brought on by the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Some islands reserve their best locally grown vegetables and fruits for export, which further limits access to these foods, especially to poorer families. Instead, there is a greater consumption of unhealthy, inexpensive, highly processed foods and beverages, which are calorie dense and nutrient poor. <clears throat> the World Trade Organization prohibits bans on importation of these foods into our region. Barbados has implemented a tax on sugar sweetened beverages to discourage consumption, but benefits of this taxation are questionable. Being overweight or obese is one of the leading risk factors of NCDs. It is the combined consequence of physical inactivity and an unhealthy diet. It is associated with hypertension, high cholesterol, which leads to heart attacks and strokes, diabetes, asthma, arthritis, liver disease, and multiple different cancers. It is also associated with poor self-esteem, social isolation, and clinical depression. The Caribbean has a high portion of persons living with overweight or obesity. The high prevalence in the islands is shown here, along with the associated prevalence of hypertension and diabetes. Overweight and obesity prevalence is extremely high in adult populations. Distressingly, one in three children in the Caribbean lives with overweight or obesity. Haiti, has, Haiti also has a high proportion of overweight and obesity despite the poverty, though to a lesser degree than its neighbors, demonstrating that obesity may occur in extreme poverty. Globally, poverty is becoming increasingly linked to overweight or obesity. Consumption is changing now to include more energy dense, less diverse, and highly processed foods, including animal products, oils and fats, refined carbohydrates, sugar sweetened beverages, along with behavioral changes such as increased snacking and increased eating outside the home. This dietary pattern is a result of a globally flawed food system and has direct implications for NCDs, promoting obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and some cancers. People in conflict settings. People in conflict settings, as seen now in Haiti, are often more vulnerable to NCDs because of an increase in negative coping mechanisms which are often NCD risk factors such as smoking and alcohol consumption. This is compounded by healthcare systems that are weakened as a result of the conflict. Furthermore, NCD management, particularly in conflict settings, is often disrupted. Individuals in emergency situations, such as natural disasters, are two to three times more likely to experience stroke and heart attack. Migrants and refugees, such as climate refugees, also have an increased vulnerability to experiencing NCDs due to the disruption of regular treatment and medical care during travel, in addition to other factors. Why then is obesity so pervasive in our children and adults? Historically, being plump was associated with wealth, but the problem is greater than cultural beliefs. Stress is known to alter the genetic expression of harmful genes and the likelihood of NCDs, including hypertension, diabetes, and cancers. Caribbean people have gone through centuries of stress. This likely may explain why NCDs have passed through the generations to affect our people to this extent today. Studies show that Afro-Caribbean people have higher rates of diabetes than West Africans. Natural selection that occurred when West Africans traversed the treacherous middle passage may also explain the high incidence of hypertension born from a high tolerance of salt. 
We see here how active we all should be in various stages of life as advised by the World Health Organization in 2022. As one of the lifestyle behaviors, physical activity reduces the risk of all cause mortality by about 33%. However, the absence or insufficient level of physical activity causes many health problems. In Jamaica, one third of persons are inactive. In Grenada, one in five adults are inactive. However, four out of five of their adolescents are inactive. In Antigua, an alarming three out of four adolescents are inactive. Data in Haiti is unavailable. Cannabis use has recently been decriminalized in many Caribbean islands and is now being viewed as a potential economic product for export for its medicinal and pleasure-related benefits. Although known to be potentially harmful for de brain development when used before age 25, its use is no longer illegal by the age of 18 years. From a cultural perspective, cannabis may be viewed as a way to positively influence mental health well-being, but as we will discuss, may also negatively impact health. The region is renowned for its harmful use of alcohol. The Caribbean has a romantic relationship with rum that has been nourished since the days of slavery. Males consume significantly more than females. Grenada is well above the regional average with males consuming approximately 14 liters per person per year. The COVID-19 pandemic adds another dimension. It caused greater premature mortality for persons with NCDs, it worsened mental health illness, it drained resources in the health systems globally, it plummeted some Caribbean households into poverty, the response to vaccines in the region was limited. So the pandemic has further impeded achievement of United Nations Goal 3.4. Clearly, it is not as simple as following the doctor's advice to make positive behavioral change. Behavioral changes, at the very least, require the recognition and acceptance of the need to change, the motivation to do so, and the support for the transition. The importance of good mental health and well-being is culturally understated in the Caribbean. The need for sound mental health to make critical decisions regarding one's health cannot be overemphasized. It impacts one's coping skills on a societal basis. It can impact social stability and economic viability. Poor mental well being may lead to poor school or work performance, absenteeism, alcohol and drug use, misuse, and suicide attempts. The recent COVID 19 pandemic worsened the risk of death of persons living with NCDs and negatively impacted mental well being. However, it also fostered a greater appreciation for mental health and generated more services for care. The World Health Organization created a global action plan to address NCDs to achieve a 25% reduction in premature mortality due to NCDs. This is now extended to 2030 by the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4 to reduce premature mortality by one third. These include one, behavioral risk factors to reduce alcohol consumption by 10%, physical inactivity by 10%, and tobacco use by 10%, 30%. Two, biological risk factors to have a 25% reduction in elevated blood pressure and 0% increase in diabetes or obesity. Three, improved national systems response to ensure 50% drug therapy for heart attacks and strokes and 80% coverage of essential medications and technologies. Unfortunately, progress to achieve these goals was extremely slow between 2010 to 2016. In fact, premature mortality increased slightly. COVID-19 would have pushed this up further between 2020 and 2021. Although all Caribbean countries have declared a commitment to the United Nations goal of 3.4, progress has been limited. This table shows the progress made by countries in achieving the listed action plans in 2020. Implementation of policies on tobacco and alcohol restriction and policies to reduce access to unhealthy foods have been limited. COVID-19 has only further impeded any progress. Thank you, Ted.
My name is Divya, and I will be joining with Leo to discuss a very important risk factor, climate change. Climate change has been described the greatest existential threat to human existence and planetary health in modern time. Temperatures have increased about one degree centigrade from pre-industrial times. The reason for this is the increased carbon emissions caused by industrialization. The largest emitters are China, the United States, and India. Small island developing states, like the Caribbean, are the smallest emitters of carbon dioxide, but experience the worst consequence. The past decade has been the hottest record in history, and the increase has caused devastating floods, vast wildfires, catastrophic cyclones, and severe droughts across the globe. These extreme weather phenomena cost lives, threaten food security, and cause loss of biodiversity. Some countries face famine and consequent social conflicts forcing people to migrate to become internal or external climate climate refugees. In October 2022, the United Nations declared the current plans by governments to curtail the rise in temperatures were ineffective, and that immediate and drastic changes were needed to maintain the 1.5 goal in 2070. A quarter million persons have died in the Caribbean over the past 70 years from adverse weather events. Between 1966 and 2015, 60% of all climate-related disasters in small island developing states occurred in the Caribbean. Our region accounted for about 90% of all deaths, 79% of all affected persons, and almost 90% of all damage costs within that period. This level of devastation has had a huge consequence on physical and mental health, infrastructures, and Caribbean economic growth. This infographic demonstrates how climate change impacts human health. Heat stress and extreme weather events directly put lives at risk. They increase the risk of communicable diseases by increasing the likelihood of food, water, and vector-borne diseases, such as gastrointestinal disease, dengue, and leptospirosis. They also cripple infrastructures, as was seen in Hurricane Irma, Maria, and Dorian, when thousands of people lacked access to basic utilities like safe water and electricity. During and post these events, Health services for persons living with NCDs experience disruptions of vital components of their care, such as access to medication, cancer chemotherapy, radiation, or dialysis. Such extreme shocks to the environment impact the mental well being. Persons living with NCD often develop mental illnesses post disaster, including post traumatic stress disorder. The mirror image is also true where the stress of events may trigger the onset of NCD in persons previously well or with mental illness. Coping mechanisms in the face of these disasters may be harmful and include excessive use of alcohol, smoking, and even suicide. When we consider implementations of national policies to achieve the Sustainable Development Goal 3.4, government's short and medium term plans have to be abandoned or delayed to rebuild after the devastation of a hurricane. But even without the the shock of extreme weather events, rising temperatures worsen NCD outcomes. A Lancet systematic review and meta-analysis published last year showed that for every one degree Celsius increase in temperature above reference temperature, there is an associated 2.1% increase in cardiovascular disease related to mortality. The risk is worse in women, persons over 65, persons living in the tropics, and persons from lower and middle income out countries. Heat waves are associated with an 11.7% increase in mortality. Extreme weather events and rising temperatures may also increase morbidity and mortality in patients living with diabetes, especially in those with cardiovascular complications. Increase in environmental temperatures are also associated with direct changes in behavior, leading towards aggression and violence. Of course, the more complex social impacts of food insecurity, likelihood of poverty will also pressure societies to experience more conflict. Food systems which are already harmful to human health are disrupted by external shocks. Crops are harmed by floods or droughts, thus worsening the disparities and forcing more persons into poverty and worsening food security. People may sell their possessions to be able to afford the most basic of needs, leaking what little capital they may have. Poverty, as we discussed before, widens the gap for access to appropriate care, increases risk of NCDs, and worsens health outcomes. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have further forced these vulnerable populations into deeper despair. 
Let us briefly consider the impacts of climate change on our oceans. Many Caribbean people depend on the sea as a source for protein and livelihood. But the ecosystem supported by coral reefs is under threat. Coral reefs throughout the Caribbean have become extremely warm. When coral reefs are stressed by changing conditions such as temperature, light, or nutrients, they expel the symbiotic algae living in the tissue, causing them to turn completely white. Their change from vibrant colors to a dull white is referred to as coral bleaching. Reef fish need healthy corals to survive. Fewer reef fish means increased food insecurity and economic instability. Sargassum seaweed has also exploded across the region in the warming oceans. Sometimes, sometimes it causes a blanket over the water surface for several square miles. This limits access of the coral to sunlight. Thought to be due to a mixture of climate change and runoff of agricultural pollutants off of the coast of North America, the sargassum seaweed growth has exploded. It has negatively impacted tourism and the fishing industry in our region while also harming the reef ecosystem. Lionfish. Lionfish is an invasive species from Asia. It adds a further threat to the fragile reef ecosystem in the Caribbean. The lionfish thrives in warm waters, and its population has outstripped its predators multifold in this region. It feeds on smaller fish and crustaceans that are part of the human food chain. Their presence in the Caribbean waters worsens the fragility of this ecosystem, and human intervention is required to reverse the problem. The Climate Vulnerability Index is a combination of sensitivity to climatic variations, the probability of adverse climate change, and adaptive capacity. All Caribbean islands have high climate vulnerability. Most of the Caribbean capitals are, are, are coastal. We remain under threat of rising sea levels as well as more powerful hurricanes. Although there has been no change in the total annual rainfall in the past century, the number of wet days and dry days have increased, and the region is expected to become drier and hotter by the end of the century. However, Haiti is the most vulnerable country to climate change in Latin America and the Caribbean. Factors heightening its vulnerability include topography, land use practices, low per capita income, high population density, and limited infrastructure and services. Widespread deforestation and unmaintained drainage infrastructure increase Haiti's vulnerability to hurricanes, storm surges, and flooding. In September of 2022, the Barbados Prime Minister, the Honorable Nia Mali, spoke passionately to the United Nations General Assembly of the high that, that small islands developed in states or SIDS experience. SIDS have incurred increased deaths from climate change, COVID-19, and the supply crisis brought on by the Russian Ukraine war. She proposed the debt for climate swaps. Debt for climate swaps allow SIDS to reduce their debt obligation in exchange for a commitment to finance domestic climate projects with the freed up financial resources. Additionally, governments throughout the Caribbean have made nationally determined contributions, or NDCs. NDCs embody multiple efforts by each country to reduce national emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. They are the heart of the Paris Agreement. For example, Antigua Barbuda has committed to switch from fossil to electricity generated through wind and solar energy. Grenada has committed to improving gender equity while also improving agricultural practices. Jamaica has similar plans while also addressing land use and forestry emissions. Haiti, understandably, has not yet created NDC, but all countries receive the support of the United Nations Development Program and other international agencies. However, none of these efforts will matter unless the main carbon emitting offenders act now. Thank you, students. Over to you, Mrs. Sobers. All right, great.
Thank you, Dr. Walwyn and her students for the back thought provoking session. Thanks so much, guys. I'm gonna introduce you all now to Patricia. Patricia is a known subject to us here that was diagnosed with her first mental health disorder at the age of 11. She comes from a middle income family with her two parents and three brothers. She's now a mother, one daughter and a wife. The use of substances has shown to have adverse effects on mental and physical health, including disability and death. Many drugs of abuse are illegal, but it is of concern that the ones that result in the most death and disability worldwide are namely alcohol and tobacco, and those are completely legal. Cannabis and other commonly, uh, is another commonly abused drug, and that's having um, restrictions lifted in many countries. Today, Dr. Joanne Brathwaite, a Barbados-based psychiatrist and AUA student, Erda Saka, Tiffany Cahides, and Joseph DiStefano will take us through the impact that these three substances have in the Caribbean. Over to you, Dr. Brathwaite and students. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. We'll start by looking at alcohol as a risk factor for non-communicable disease. Erda? Alcohol has been linked to over 200 health conditions, including liver disease, blood injuries, violence, cancers, cardiovascular disease, suicides, tuberculosis, HIV, or AIDS. Its impact is detrimental in every country in the region. The less developed the country is, the higher the relative burden of alcohol. Alcohol was responsible for 5.5% of all deaths in the Americas and 6.7% of all disability adjusted life years. Heavy episode drinking affects 21.3% of the total population over 15 years old. Among adolescents aged 15 to 19 years, 18.3% are also heavy episode drinkers. Alcohol is classified as the group one carcinogen, which means it is in the highest risk group of car carcinogens. It causes at least seven types of cancers, including common ones such as bowel cancer and breast cancer. Alcohol remains the only psychoactive and dependence producing substance that exerts a significant impact on the global population health that is not controlled at the international level by legally binding regulatory instruments. 8.2% of the general population over 15 years old had an alcohol use disorder. The Americas have the highest prevalence of alcohol use disorder among women at 5.1% and prevalence among men, 11.8%, which is second only to the European region. The harmful use of alcohol is a casual factor in more than 200 disease and injury conditions. Damage from its use can start before birth when the woman consumes it. Premature labor is not an uncommon outcome. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorders can also result from it. These children have myriad mental and physical problems and are at a higher risk of development delay, abuse, and neglect. Alcohol is a risk factor for mental disorders. The comorbidity of alcohol use disorder and other severe mental illness is common. Alcohol can complicate the diagnosis of other mental disorders due to its ability to cause many symptoms and signs of common mental disorders, as well as induce other psychiatric syndromes. Persons living with severe mental disorders, such bipolar disorder, are less able to adhere to the treatment regimes when comorbid alcohol use complicates their illness. The outcomes are therefore suboptimal. In addition, it increases the risk of many physical disorders, such as type 2 diabetes, which carry their own risk of mental disorder. Type 2 diabetes is itself associated with a twofold risk of, of major depressive disorder. 
Furthermore, the abuse of alcohol in young people is associated with poor academic performance, early school leaving, occupational dysfunction, and can interfere with the formation of healthy relationships. In a recent poll of people living in the region, an overwhelming majority believe that alcohol can be harmful to the brain and heart in even adolescents. However, as this slide illustrates, this belief does not seem to influence the behavior. In the Caribbean, St. Vincent and the Grandins have the highest abuse rates among secondary students, but Antigua and Barbuda are unfortunately not far behind. The average annual consumption for drinkers in Antigua and Barbuda is 6.4 liters, with men consuming 10.3 liters and women 2.7 liters. On the islands, the choice of drink is beer or spritzers, but rum, with a much higher percentage of alcohol by volume, is also heavy consumed by some drinkers. In Antigua and the rest of the Caribbean, education and awareness in school is limited. This, coupled with early alcohol introduction in the home, can lead to its abuse in minors. The early heavy use of any substance abuse increases the risk of developing both mental and physical health complications. There is only one center for drug rehabilitation and mental disorders in Antigua, and the costs for the program are paid by the end user. This could make it inaccessible to many persons who need it, unless scholarships are provided. Only one fourth of countries have cohesive national awareness or drug abuse prevention plan. Specifically in the Caribbean, there is a need for education and awareness programs in workplaces and schools. Drug rehabilitation facilities need to be increased and made more accessible through money provided by the government, which could be found, founded through increased taxation on alcohol. The availability of alcohol needs to be restricted and the legal age for drinking should be raised to 21 years. Thank you, Erda. From her presentation, we can see though that people are seemingly giving informed consent to develop NCDs and even die as a result of alcohol use. We propose that addressing underlying mental health with a view to behavior change is the single most important solution. Now let's take a look at tobacco as another risk factor for non-communicable disease. Joseph and Tiffany, Please share your finding. Tobacco is harmful in all of its forms, and it kills more than 8 million people each year. More than 7 million deaths that occur annually are the result of direct tobacco use, while around 1.2 million are the result of non-smokers being exposed to secondhand smoke. In 2020, 22.3% of the global population used tobacco, 36.7% of all men, and 7.8% of the world's women. Nicotine contained in tobacco is highly addictive, and tobacco use is a major risk factor for cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, over 20 different types or subtypes of cancers, and many other debilitating conditions. Most tobacco-related deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries, which are often targets of intensive tobacco marketing. Let's talk more about some of the complications that smokers are vulnerable to. To start, the CDC tells us that the life expectancy for smokers is at least 10 years shorter than non-smokers. As some of us may know, smokers are more likely than non-smokers to develop lung-related problems, such as cancer, bronchitis, and COPD, but they're also at high risk for developing many other cardiovascular diseases. According to research done at Johns Hopkins, cigarette smokers are between two to four times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease than non-smokers. Additionally, they have found that smoking doubles a person's chance for developing a stroke in their lifetime. This research at Hopkins also uncovered in a study that for all age groups combined, 65.8% of participants who had ever smoked were seven times more likely to have tried marijuana, seven times more likely to have tried cocaine, 14 times more likely to have tried crack cocaine, and 16 times more likely to have tried heroin. So this suggests that tobacco use can act as a powerful gateway to use multiple, to the use of multiple harmful and addictive substances, all of which pose an immediate threat to the physical health of the mentally ill population. Data from the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission shows a decline in the past month use amongst young people. However, the numbers are still above zero and based on the risks outlined, 
zero is the only acceptable figure. Here's an even more alarming statistic. I encourage you all to read this uh, statistic on the screen right now. Considering that approximately 13% of the population lives with a diagnosable mental disorder, according to the World Health Organization, this statistic suggests that persons with mental illness smoke a disproportionately large quantity of cigarettes compared to the rest of the population. Okay, so now the question is why? Why is it that persons with mental illness smoke more cigarettes than those without mental illness? Well, the data shows that there are multiple reasons as to why this occurs. For starters, it has been found that persons with mental illness are not counted properly by healthcare providers. Physicians tend to see persons with mental illness as persons who are incapable of quitting and incapable of understanding the negative impacts of substance abuse. Because of this, when given the opportunity to counsel their patients on the harmful effects of smoking, they will simply choose not to. On top of this, people with behavioral health conditions are targets of aggressive commercial tobacco marketing. The tobacco industry has a history of making financial contributions to organizations that work with people with behavioral health conditions and have even given free or discounted cigarettes to psychiatric facilities. In the past, tobacco companies have funded research to support ideas that have proven to be untrue, including the idea that people with schizophrenia could not develop lung cancer, and the idea that people with mental health conditions need cigarettes to treat their symptoms. These misconceptions that smoking could alleviate symptoms of mental health conditions also greatly affect mental health providers' willingness to offer smoking cessation treatments to the people that actually need it. In one large study of a metropolitan area, people who had a serious mental health condition were twice as likely as those without a serious mental health condition to live in a neighborhood with more tobacco retailers and more advertisements for commercial tobacco products. An unfortunate truth about dealing with mental health problems is that it's hard. The amount of stigma, ridicule, marginalization, and mistreatment that persons with mental illness deal with on a daily basis forces them to find solutions. Unfortunately, not all of those solutions are good for their physical health. One of the reasons why we see such a high tobacco consumption rate among this population is because that it is used as a coping mechanism. Additionally, those who have chemical imbalances in the brain may be more susceptible to withdrawal symptoms and therefore may face a harder journey when it comes to time to try to quit tobacco. On top of that, many persons who are on medications for their mental health are ineligible to take certain tobacco cessation medications due to the potentially harmful drug interaction. So not only is this population more likely to start smoking, but they are less likely to quit. This has huge implications on the physical health of this population and is something that we really want to address today. The solution, over the years, there have been many attempts at reducing the use of cigarettes. Research on the WHO Empower and WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control shows that the top five interventions include price increases to higher taxes, smoking restrictions, smoking cessation therapies, advertising and promotional bans, and consumer education campaigns. But from these five, the most effective intervention was price increases through higher taxes. But even more interesting is that all of these tools combined yielded better results than just picking one approach. Ideally, our approach would follow this model. We would start by increasing the price of tobacco products in hopes of deterring customers and using the extra taxpayer money to fund our next steps. According to WHO and Tegan Barbuda, there remains inadequate implementation of the Empower initiatives. Monitoring of tobacco use is suboptimal. There is no comprehensive cessation program. Taxation on cigarettes is 13%, and the cost of tobacco products has not changed since 2010. As cigarette sales have fallen, tobacco companies have been aggressively marketing new products like e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products, and they lobby governments to limit their regulation. Electronic nicotine delivery systems are marketed by their manufacturers as safer alternatives. Research shows that children and adolescents who use these devices are twice as likely to use conventional cigarettes. So measures focused on conventional tobacco products must be brought in to target these new emerging products if another generation is to be saved from the nicotine addiction and its sequelae. We thought that it would be best to start with our first line of defense, the healthcare providers. Physicians are our first line of defense because they are trained to spot mental health disorders and those that are at high risk of developing them. It is the physicians that will address the topic of substance abuse with the patient and educate them on the risks of continued use and the benefits of quitting. However, as we learned from the previous slides, we have a long way to go. 
there is a lack of knowledge and a surplus of misconceptions that surrounds mental health disorders and tobacco use. We need to educate the healthcare system on how to effectively tackle these topics before it can be applied and used in actual practice. Thank you very much, Tiffany and Joseph. And again, we see mental ill health as the driving force behind significant disability and death from NCDs. Because based on the facts that they presented, if we adequately address the mental ill health of just 13% of the population, we could reduce by almost half the consumption of tobacco in this hemisphere. Mental ill health is the problem and mental health is the solution. We'll now look at the abuse of cannabis as an emerging risk factor. In 2020, more than 4% of the global population aged 15 to 64, and that accounts for 209 million people, had used cannabis in the past year. Compared with adults, the past year prevalence of cannabis use is reported to be higher among adolescents and between the ages of 15 and 16 years, 5.8% of those had used cannabis. At the global level, approximately two thirds of past year cannabis users are men, but that proportion varies substantially by region. And in the Caribbean, we are seeing much higher prevalence rates among our young females. According to the Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission, in the Caribbean region, past month use among young people aged 11 to 18 years remained quite high. Antigua and Barbuda's rates were among the highest in the region. And we have to make the point that all substances and cannabis is a chief offender are most deleterious to developing brains, especially when use is consistent and heavy. Now, many people are actually quite familiar with the effects of acute intoxication from cannabis, but long-term effects also have to be considered. There is a consistent dose response relationship in a number of prospective studies between cannabis use in adolescents and the risk of developing psychotic symptoms or even full-blown schizophrenia. Case control studies as far back as 2003 and as recently as 2013 have consistently found deficits in verbal learning, memory, and attention in regular cannabis users. Marijuana cigarettes, tend to be smoked without filters. They're inhaled more deeply and smoked to a much smaller butt size. And that leads to higher amounts of smoke being drawn into the lungs than with cigarette smoking. Marijuana smoke also leads then to a five times greater absorption of carbon monoxide than traditional cigarettes. And due to how long marijuana smoke is held in the lungs, there is a four times greater deposition of tar in the lungs than with regular cigarettes. Benzopyrene, which is a known cancer causing agent, is also present in similar amounts in marijuana as in cigarettes. Chronic bronchitis in the absence of COPD has been shown in longitudinal studies of cannabis smokers. And as recently as January of this year, we had reinforced that there is an increased risk of coronary artery disease in frequent cannabis smokers. Now, I want to be clear, the cannabinoids, Delta 98C and cannabidiol are not carcinogenic, but cannabis smoke is. Therefore, cannabis smoking can, like cigarette smoking, cause cancers of the lung, the upper air digestive tract, and even the bladder. Now, we've looked at the health problems related to the use of the individual substances, but they're often used in combination. The prevalence of cannabis and tobacco use has increased over time, as has co-use, particularly among young adults aged 18 to 24 years. And if we apply our knowledge about marijuana smokers' tendency to inhale more deeply, hold the inhaled smoke longer, and not use filters, the increased danger from co-use becomes clearer. We can see that the health risks would have to be amplified. More research is needed in this area, especially in the Caribbean, where co-use is actually more the norm than the exception. Now, the demographics of co-users are similar to those who show cancer-related health disparities, those being from a lower socioeconomic status, 
being a part of certain racial or ethnic minority groups, as well as having pre-existing mental or physical health problems. There are also several hidden risks associated with co-use that the public may not even think about, such as first and secondhand smoke exposure from cannabis use. The rapidly changing policies around cannabis's legal use have been correlated with decreased perceptions of cannabis-related harm in the last 10 years, and lower harm perceptions of cannabis are correlated with more frequent and intense use. So simply put, the safer people think cannabis is, the more likely they are to use it. The tobacco industry spends about $24 million per day in marketing and advertising. That's just over $9 billion per year. The cannabis industry is estimated to spend about $6 million per day on marketing. So that's about another $2 billion per year. So with cannabis and big tobacco advertising outpacing public health efforts to intervene on the health consequences, this will remain a key factor in shaping co-use in the future. And we've looked at alcohol separately. We've looked at cannabis separately. But we have to talk about co-use of those substances as well. Among alcohol drinkers, cannabis is the most widely used drug, with about 58% of adolescent drinkers reporting marijuana use. Recent studies show that when cannabis and alcohol are consumed together, higher quantities of both substances are used, and they're used more frequently when compared to either substance being consumed alone. If used together, there's a greater likelihood of negative side effects occurring, either physically, such as nausea, vomiting, or dizziness, or psychologically, like panic, milder anxiety, or even full-blown paranoia. Intoxication is compounded when the drugs are used in combination, especially when persons use edible forms of cannabis, because alcohol causes vessels in the stomach to vasodilate and that allows for greater absorption of THC. Both drugs are known to impair reaction time and judgment. And in combination, those effects are additive. So risky practices, including unsafe sexual practices or dry and unsafe driving are more likely increased, thereby increasing the risk of harm. It is not surprising, therefore, that heavier dual use of cannabis and alcohol during adolescence are associated with more negative outcomes in adulthood, including substance dependence, involvement with the criminal justice system, or low rates of high school graduation compared to no use of either substance alone. Rates of illicit drug and alcohol use disorders and psychiatric admissions are also higher among co-users. With ongoing policy changes surrounding the legalization of cannabis use, examining the influence of co-use of alcohol and cannabis use patterns, the use disorders, as well as associated cannabis and alcohol problems actually takes on greater importance. So what are the solutions when we talk about cannabis use and related problems? Well, the first step to finding solutions is always to recognize that there's a problem. The perception that cannabis is natural, benign, and beneficial is a significant challenge. Evidence about the usefulness of the cannabis derivatives for the treatment of certain medical conditions cannot be allowed to overshadow the dangers of smoking cannabis. Let me be very clear. There is no known health benefit to smoking cannabis. While some restrictions on production and sale exist, in many countries that have decriminalized or legalized cannabis, the coexistence of illegal black markets makes effective control especially problematic. At present, public health spending on drug abuse awareness is only about 10% of spending on the marketing of the substances of abuse. So statistically significant increases in public health funding would need to occur in order to counteract industry spending and messaging aimed at recruiting and retaining new consumers for the cannabis and tobacco and alcohol markets. An organized approach to liberalization of any kind needs to occur. 
especially in the low and middle income countries where the risk profiles of users differ from those in the developed countries and the funds available to deal with the medical, psychiatric and social fallout of cannabis use and related disorders is very limited. Liberalization has to be coupled with commensurate increases in public education, enforceable and enforced restrictions on access by minors and increases in drug rehabilitation and psychosocial interventions that are available to those who develop harmful use patterns. Taxation, as well as diversion of monies previously spent on the judicial system costs are possible sources of funds. But a special focus on the youth, where cannabis exerts its most deleterious effects is absolutely essential. In most cases, as, we, as we've seen, Substance use starts as a choice, often despite knowledge of the harmful effects. We need to ensure the mental health of our population so that they choose healthy life. Restrictions help, but ultimately mental ill health is the problem and mental health is the solution. Thank you very much. Just some of our references. Mrs. Silvers, back to you. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Braffitt and students. Patricia has struggled with her use of tobacco as a coping mechanism in her late teens to early 20s. As an adult, she used burning with cigarettes as a means of self-harm, something that she is still learning to control slowly. Patricia also is diabetic and hypertensive. They were both difficult to manage during pregnancy, but she was able to maintain, um, to abstain, sorry, from substances, something that many women struggle to do. In addition to the risks associated with drugs, alcohol, and tobacco use, the scourge of crime and violence has continued to plague many countries of the Caribbean. It is critical for persons working with children or youth, quote unquote, at risk, to be fully equipped with the skills needed to identify and manage the resulting trauma. They must be empowered to maintain their own resiliency and wellness as they strive towards maintaining peace. Our next presenter, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim Scott, sorry, is the founder and director of the Child Resiliency Program in Jamaica, which is an evidence-based uh, based program for the protection of children from violence and adverse childhood experiences. She currently also provides training in building peace, resiliency, and wellness in the context of trauma to multiple groups. Let us welcome Mariam Ahmad, Ocean Crawley Sweeney, Tia Diaz, and Dr. Kim Scott to give the presentation on violence, trauma, and resiliency. But first, let's pause for our fitness break with Daniel Walwyn. Hello everyone, welcome to your very, very first movement break. I'm excited to be moving with you. We're talking all about what we should be doing, so I think we need to practice what we're preaching. So I'm inviting everybody to stand up. I'm just gonna be moving for a few minutes. I'm gonna be here demonstrating. And one thing I'd like you to do as we're having this conversation about health and specifically about mental health, I want you to check in with yourself See how you're feeling right now. I like to do this before we do movement breaks, just to emphasize how effective they are. So check in, see how you're feeling. Maybe a little tired, maybe a little overwhelmed, maybe happy. Yeah, so just check in, make a mental note, and then we're gonna do a check-in again at the very end of our movement break. Okay, always encourage you to integrate these wherever and however you can into your time. Are you ready? Yeah, from the time I wake, from the time I wake, I'm in the spirits come. 
just two minutes ago and that is the power of physical activity. I'll see you again for our second movement break. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Sobers, and thank you, Ms. Walwyn, for that very fun activity. Now we're going to be talking about violence, trauma, and oh, I'm on mute. And resiliency. First off, what is the prevalence of violence in the Caribbean? The prevalence of violence in the Caribbean murders can vary based off of the country, the circumstances of the crime as well. The three major forms of violence are gun violence, domestic violence, and gang violence. For gun violence, firearms are the most commonly used weapons for violent crimes in the Caribbean. Domestic violence includes intimate partners, family-related homicides, and these can sometimes lead to murder. Gang violence involves multiple victims and they are extremely violent. Gun violence in the Caribbean is the high, has high levels of violent crime and discourages investment, disrupts tourism and contributes to a culture of fear and mistrust in the communities. The Caribbean has the second highest homicide rates in the world, with gun violence being the most common method of homicide. The graph on the right illustrates Jamaica having the highest rates of gun violence, particularly in 2017. The graph illustrates the homicide rate in Jamaica from 2014 to 2022 in number of homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. Relating violence and homicide, the Caribbean region has a high rate of violent crime, including homicide. The homicide rate in the Caribbean was 16 per 100,000. This is higher than the global average of 6.1 homicides per 100,000 population. The graph on the right here illustrates the homicide rates in selected Latin American and Caribbean countries in 2022 in number of homicides per 100,000 inhabitants. Again, we can see Jamaica as number one with Venezuela following and Trinidad and Tobago as third. Who are the victims for violence in the Caribbean? According to the International Monetary Fund, Crime in the Caribbean is disproportionately affecting poorer males between the ages of 18 and 30. 
On the graph on the left, we see that the bar in orange is higher for males than females, and the bar in green is higher in young males compared to middle and the elderly ages 55 plus. The graph and picture on the right illustrates that violence against women has serious health consequences. These include physical injuries, unintended pregnancies included, induced abortions, sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, harmful use of drugs, tobacco, and alcohol, and death. What's the economic impact of violence in the Caribbean? Costs of intimate partner and sexual violence for countries are very high. They include the provision of health, social, and legal services, as well as the cost of lost earnings. Intimate partner violence is a form of domestic violence, which is described by physical, sexual, or psychological harm by a current or former partner or spouse. In the United States, one in every five women report that they have been victims of IPV. 81% of women who have experienced violence have a chronic disease, and 41% of US Caribbean women are reported victims of intimate partner violence. Women of Women who are victims of, in, of intimate partner violence are more likely to suffer from chronic conditions as a result of the abuse, including increased risk of STDs. These include chronic pain, depression, obesity, gastrointestinal orders, eating disorders, and substance abuse. I'm not gonna pass it on to Ocean, who's gonna talk more about violence, trauma, and resilience. Every minute, 24 people become victims of violence across the world. One in four women and one in seven men have been the victim of abuse, while three million children have witnessed violence between their caregivers. Understanding the connection between violence and health is an important start for working towards reducing the prevalence of both violence and chronic illness. With many health concerns and the overall increase of violence and homicide rates throughout the world, there is an immense impact on productivity and, and the economy. The World Economic Forum found that by 2030, mental health will have cost the world $16 trillion in lost economic output. Around 20% of the world's children and adolescents have a mental health condition, with suicide being the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. UNICEF's theory of change states that evidence suggests that toxic stress associated with exposure to violence in childhood can impair brain development and damage other parts of the nervous system with lifelong consequences. Psychological trauma along with physical damage to the brain are major factors affecting a victim's mental health and cognitive abilities while growing up. Child and adolescent survivors are two times more likely to experience depression and significantly more likely to engage in substance abuse. Adults reporting exposure to violence as children had increased likelihood of a number of chronic health conditions compared to those without such exposures. Childhood abuse and harsh physical treatment at home was a precursor for violence as an adult, and those affected were at a greater risk for, for suffering from intimate partner violence, especially women. Violence affects the lives of up to 1 billion children with long lasting and costly emotional, social, and economic consequences, which were touched upon earlier. From the 34 Latin American and Caribbean countries reviewed in this study, 30 to 60% of the children were abused with the percent decreasing with age for physical abuse, but the percentage staying the same for emotional violence. Adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, are pot potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, zero to 17 years of age. This could be experiencing violence such as physical, sexual, or verbal abuse, or emotional or physical neglect. Other traumas could be witnessing violence in the home or community, having a family member attempt to die by suicide. About 61% of adults surveyed across 25 states reported that they have experienced at least one type of ACE before the age of 18. These can be long-lasting negative effects on health, well-being, as well as life opportunities such as education and job potential. By preventing ACEs, up to 1.9 million heart disease cases and 21 million cases of depression could be potentially avoided. This ACE study completed in Bermuda from 2018 to 2020 had over 700 responses and found that 60% of the respondents experienced 
childhood household dysfunction, 40% experienced childhood sexual abuse, 48% experienced prejudice, and 80% experienced trauma as a child. ACEs can lead to a variety of mental and physical health issues throughout life and into adulthood. Some of the most common chronic health issues associated with ACEs are heart disease, asthma, obesity, mental illness, cancer, and diabetes. Those who have experienced ACEs also have a harder time staying focused and are more likely to have risk-seeking behaviors. Next, Tia Diaz will be discussing the protective factors and psychosocial support in the Caribbean. Thank you, Ocean. Um, the slides just presented highlight the exorbitant burden of trauma currently existing within the Caribbean context and linked to NTDs. Resilience, however, reminds us to let go of our preoccupation with risk and deficit and focus on things that we know protect. According to the US Department of Health and Human Services, protective factors are conditions or attributes that when present in families and communities increase the well-being of children and families and reduce the likelihood of maltreatment. These protective factors include our one, parental resilience, being able to parent effectively even when on the stress, two, nurturing and attachment, a caring and emotionally sound relationship between the parent and child, three, children's social and emotional competence, encouraging and teaching the child how to express their emotions in a healthy manner, and thus building emotional intelligence, four, knowledge of parenting and child development, applying parenting strategies that support all aspects of childhood development, and the last two factors, social connections and concrete support in times of need. These two factors go together and show that when a parent has a strong support system, they, are provided, they provide a more favorable care for their child as compared to those who do not have a strong support system or access to help or resources. A study from the American Journal of Public Health examined how risk and protective factors influence health compromising behaviors in adolescents within the Caribbean region. These factors included parental connectedness, connectedness with other adults, connectedness with school, proper family care, and attendance at religious services. It was found that these factors displayed a lower rate of participation in health risk behaviors across the adolescents. However, as quoted by the article, the data described present a very limited pressure of youth health in the Caribbean, and none of these studies have provided an in-depth understanding of the protective factors. Therefore, more research needs to be done throughout the region to properly assess protective factors. Results from a systematic review of 22 Caribbean countries and Latin America discuss the lack of training and unawareness of national protocols for supporting and responding to cases of violence against children. Protocols consisted, consistently included signs and symptoms of violence against children, but inconsistently provided methods for follow-up treatments. Although highlighting the importance of mental health care following violence against children was mentioned, most of the protocols did not include resources or actionable steps for the healthcare workers working on evaluations or the survivors themselves. This displays the importance for more protocols to include mental health well-being and overall protective factors and steps to help children. Psychosocial support is offered to children in the Caribbean. Child protective services, such as girls and boys homes, which act as a residential facility for children who have been neglected, abused, or often, or often, sorry, are abundant throughout the region. School programs geared at creating and maintaining a safe and friendly school environment to reduce violence and disruptive behaviors in schools are also available. For example, the PALS program in Jamaica, which applies the five Ps, physical safety, psychological safety, policy, programs, and partnerships as a framework for maintaining a healthy school environment in Jamaica. School counseling services are available to students at the secondary school and or advanced level. Disaster recovery programs targeting children who have experienced and or been emotionally traumatized by a natural disaster, such as Hurricane Irma. And there are Caribbean mental health coaches, psychologists, and psychiatrists out there that are available for our children. However, a report named Mind the Gap, the Inadequacy of Mental Health Services for Children, issued in 2021, speaks to the inadequacy of enough psychosocial support services. We will now hear from Dr. Kim Scott about the Child Resiliency Program in Jamaica.
you have just heard from Miriam and Ocean, and they have adequately just described the current high levels of crime and violence and the adverse childhood experiences, and they're linked to the development of chronic non-communicable diseases. And Tia has just given us a quick look at some of the existing child protective services and some of the protective factors data. And I'm gonna continue now with one model that's currently operating in Jamaica for psychosocial support, as we, as we see on the screen here, representing the Child Resiliency Program. Sorry, my slide has just frozen. Give me a minute. I'm just going to pause here to recognize the team who has worked on this very diligently since 2006. And just to go back a minute, just to remind ourselves that these children at risk are at risk from so many variables as was mentioned in the risk factor presentation. So not further to the risk of the children and the adolescents who are experiencing the trauma are the frontline workers who are working with them. So there are some quotes from a church ministry leader since COVID in particular, but even before I have felt so burnt out, I know I'm barely functioning. I feel so down, the whole community is in mourning. I just want to go home and get into my bed. This is a guidance counselor in response to yet another murder outside of her school. It's just trauma after trauma. I feel tired, irritable, and angry all the time, says a teacher. So the objective of the Child Residency Program, which has been in operation since 2006, is really twofold. The first is to build resiliency by identifying and supporting those children who Ocean spoke to about, who have been considered to have adverse childhood experiences. Things like the history of sexual, physical, emotional abuse or neglect, the history of parental death or incarceration, being withdrawn, delinquency, excessive fighting, inappropriate behavior, or maybe simply reading below grade level and demonstrating this anxiety and depression that's so prevalent now amongst our children. The second arm of the program is building the peace, resiliency and wellness which were dubbing PRW in the frontline workers themselves who are working with these children and youth at risk. Through the delivery of training, whether it be at the Ministry of National Security case managers, the Ministry of Education, teachers and guidance counselors, church leaders, non-governmental organizations, and university students at the International University of the Caribbean, which is a community-based international um, university. And the curriculum has now been integrated into the bachelors of education, masters in counseling and psychology, guidance and counseling with practicum assignments at the child residency program sites, which are all located in high crime and violence communities across Jamaica. So what are some of the learning outcomes for the PRW training? We're looking at explaining the concept and interrelation between peace building, resilience and wellness, being able to identify those protective factors that build resiliency in a child and adolescent or adult, Becoming familiar with the child resiliency program model as one model for building resiliency in children and their families. Being able to demonstrate the use of resiliency tools to be able to de define the seven dimensions of wellness and apply those areas of wellness to their own lives. To be able to manifest and identify how to manage stress in all the various dimensions. To be able to understand the benefits of healthy relationships and how they're and their application in promoting peace understand the hallmarks of healthy communication patterns and how that fosters peace, to define the concepts of safety, justice, and restorative justice and freedom, understand root causes of conflict, identifying red flags of anger, and being able to manage the conflict through negotiation, mediation, and reconciliation tools, and just being able to identify what those early warning signs of trauma look like that may result in violent behavior and to be able to respond appropriately to this post-traumatic stress disorder. And finally, to understand simply the process of grieving. So this PRW training is done both virtually and face-to-face, -face. but the core basis of really the Child Residency Program is that the life stories of resilient youth who have now grown into adulthood teach us that competence and confidence resulting in the highest levels of productivity can flourish even under adverse traumatic circumstances, if children make positive attachments with persons allowing a secure basis for the development of resilient attributes. 
These attachment persons need support in maintaining their own ability to maintain peace, resiliency, and wellness in the context of the myriad traumatic experiences existing. It's a holistic intervention as provided rather than a piecemeal problematic based program. So these are the various arms of the program, which you'll, you'll see highlighted later on. But the theory of change is really such that if children and their parents are supported by those arms of the program and the PRW training and support for the frontline workers is offered, then children and parents will display an increase in resilient attributes, coping mechanisms, and life skills, including simple things, impulse control, ability to express their emotions, both positive and negative, an increased sense of belonging, improved self-esteem, greater confidence, the ability to engage in productive interactions with their peers and other authority figures. And if children display an increase in these resilient attributes, then they will have greater protection from and reduce risk of violence, exploitation, and abuse. And if the frontline workers display an increase in their own ability to remain at peace, resilient, and well, they will be better able to provide these positive supportive services. So the services are offered after school in small groups of 10 to 12 children. And I said the arms of the program are the academic support, which is just building up their lit reading skills via computer and chalk and talk methodology, life skills training and mentorship, parenting and family support, counseling and home visits. The sports and cultural um, arts are probably the pillars of the, of the whole program. And Mrs. Ms. Daniel Walwin will speak further to the importance of that sports and physical activity in promoting healing and the mental health and reinforcing all the life skills training activities that are taught throughout the year. And then of course, a meal is very critical along with the PRW frontline workers training. All the services offered are based on three basic pillars of resiliency, promoting caring relationships, communicating high expectations of these children, providing opportunities for meaningful participation and setting clear and consistent rules and boundaries. And I just have to pause say that as a physician, having been through years of medical school, many, many seminars at adolescent medicine conferences and doing a degree in public health, and it has really come down to these very simple but profound basic things that we need to incorporate in, into our community-based programs. So again, the cultural arts, very important. They're dancing, they're drumming, they're learning and in, engaging the learning and thinking area of the brain to manage their trauma. In circle time, we call this a life skills training. They're going through a series of themes each week, whether it be problem solving, anger management, um, decision making, handling their anger. And again, all of these life skills themes are integrated into the sports and into the cultural football, the boxing and the cultural activities. As I said, the food is critical. And I just in this um, slide is just remind, reminding us importance of the partnership with the police that has helped us to stay engaged in, in these communities that are high conflict ridden and also simply to help us to get into homes when during the COVID period when we had to transition to our feeding program. The follow-up of the children is important and we do this through um, follow-up of football talent at, at matches they go to compete with more upper echelon areas of Jamaica and again the parenting and family component is critical to the process. So this is a parent just giving his testimony on the importance of mental health and how it's impacted on his child. We have a reward system for those children who are actually able to self-regulate and be able to manage their behaviors appropriately. And so the group prize is usually taking a child out of their community into a green space. And apart from the group prize, there are also individual behavioral prizes and recognitions for when children are actually able to modulate and manage their self-control. Again, the sporting and physical activities are hugely important along with the reward systems. We close off the, the one year activity with um, a program leaving ceremony, usually where children get to a chance to demonstrate the skills that they've, they've been taught and to have a certification process in place. So this program was evaluated in 2019-20 out of Manitou, New York. And at that time, we looked at, um, they looked at the academic profile of the children, their risk behaviors, their resilient attributes, and their strengths and support assessment. And then a follow-up questionnaire after one year with the child and the parent, along with mid-year focus group evaluations with the teachers. 
Also, we do annually focus group discussions with the children, parents, teachers, guidance counselors, and the program facilitators to assess their risk and protective factors. So at that time, we had 22 feeder schools in the process. We have now impacted 2,120 children and their parents from 2014 to present, and another 240 children and their parents in those embryonic um, first seven years, 2006 to 2013. We are now impacting 150 students per year in the guidance and counseling and education curriculum and the psychology students who are trained in the CRP model and are currently developing their peace, resiliency and wellness skills. We're also targeting church leaders, teachers, Ministry of National Security case managers and heart instructors. So as I said, the concept of building child resiliency, whether it be through increasing their coping mechanisms and life skills, the parenting and family counseling, the teacher training, and increasing community inclusion and cohesiveness is that we have seen a reduction in the risk for aggression and violence, the fighting, the bullying, the hitting, the pushing, the name calling, the threatening, the cursing, and the generally the carrying of a weapon. So what are the outcomes? There are five main outcomes that we're looking at. Increased engagement in educational activities, greater protection from and prevention of violence, exploitation and abuse through strengthening resilient attributes, coping mechanisms and life skills, an increase in positive parental involvement, communication and appropriate discipline, improving community cohesiveness, inclusion and partnerships, and increasing the capacity of the frontline workers through this PRW training and support. So some of the academic indicators are very simple, three things, children showing an increase in literacy by one grade level, children demonstrating an increased love for learning and reading, and generally their level of attendance and engagement at school. Last year's evaluation findings found a 14% decrease in the children who are reading at grade two. Can I remind you that these children enter the program at grade five, and there was a 17% increase in the children reading at the grades four and five levels. More importantly, there was a 75% increase in the number of children who love to learn and read. In terms of the, the greater protection from violence, abuse and exploitation arm of the program, we looked at four basic indicators. That's the number of children caught in a fight or sent out of the classroom for poor behavior. The extent to which children feel safe and supported to express their emotions of grief, anger, sadness and depression. The number of children who I can identify someone who cares and to talk to for support and the number of children engaged in these sports and cultural arts in an effort to increase their resilient attributes and pro-social behaviors. This is last year's evaluation findings. We have a caring adult who felt comfortable to talk with when they're happy or sad, 38% at baseline and 91% at exit. Have an adult who believes in them, 27% at baseline, 86% at exit. Respect for self and others, 67% when they came in, 80% when they left and a sense of belonging at school or the program, 64% at baseline and 94% at exit. And that sense of belonging is critical because if they're not belonging to a program or something positive, they will be more inclined to be joining a gang where they can get a sense of this belonging. So as this facilitator says, this student was fairly shy and she's improved or he's improved since doing well in sports. He's more organized, he's leading devotions and he's showing more leadership qualities. He feels a part of something. Again, at entry, 46% of them were expressing feeling depressed and at exit, 23%. Suicidal ideation also decreased from entry to exit and there was less children who were feeling easily distracted. As this teacher says, this student lost two close family members recently to gun violence. So she's definitely at risk and she's definitely grieving. That's why I'm so glad she has access to a program like this. The parenting and family arm, there's just like a three basic indicators. The number of parents trained and reporting an appropriate increase in the use of discipline. We're looking at communication and we're looking at the level of parental involvement. Example, supervising homework and attending parent workshops. Again, last year's evaluation findings showed that there was an increased understanding of the importance of more involvement in their children's lives, including supervising homework and an increase in, in interest in school activities. There was an increased understanding of the difference between appropriate discipline and corporal punishment, reporting more displays of affection and better control of their anger, 
and parents were demonstrating being able to communicate more with their children. Some of the voices of the parents in our Caribbean lingo is I listen to the other parents at the workshop and how they deal with disciplining their children. And it helped me. Me na lick him again, me talked him. Me used to beat him, but me said, no, me I got cool it down. Or another parent. I've learned a whole lot from coming to the workshops, how to solve problems and to pay more attention to my child. Coming here helps me to deal with him a little bit softer. That's why I try to come. He appreciates when I come. A little quote from one of the focus groups from the children. Before we start, go to the program, we used to pick war with people. And them tell us that the program said, we're not love war. And from a come back to school, we not pick war again. From a parent, I see a whole heap of changes in my son and he learn a lot of things. He used to give a lot of talking and headache, but since coming here, he will do him work and ask me for help him and less TV. He's very much improved. A quote from a guidance counselor, the program children in my school are now friends. One boy had an anger problem and used to be sent to my office regularly. But since going to the program, his behavior has changed and he's more loving and will hug me now. Simple things, but important. The food, they love and need the food. For some, it is the only meal for the day and they carry home half for their parents. So this brings us to the close of this caption of the Charizency program, which as I said, is currently operating at two locations in Kingston, Jamaica. It's to sum us up, we have been following along the American Pediatrics of um, American Academy of Pediatrics elect who spoke to the business of threads and threads is what we're trying to use now to tie up the frayed ends of the rope for which these children who are suffering so many challenges and traumatic experiences in their communities. So we're focusing, as I said, on the T, the thinking and the learning brain, the H, the hope, the optimism and the faith that needs to continually be encouraged, the R, the regulation or the self-control, the efficacies that need to be built through football, through dance, through reading, and a reorienting of our education system that speaks to punishment of children who are going through and behaving, acting up in the classroom. We have a tradition from both our parents and our teachers to punish the children when they're acting out and to withdraw them from the football and take them out of the dance. And these are the only things that are holding them in terms of their mental health. And we have to do a whole mind shift in, in adjusting our expectations for this. Attachment to these safe, stable, nurturing, loving and caregivers. But we can't expect that attachment unless we ourselves build capacity in the frontline workers who are attached to these youth. We have to continue developing their skills and of course, the social connectedness speaks volumes to the importance of building resiliency. So resiliency is really built through this give and take of these safe, stable, nurturing relationships. And as I said, a dysregulated caregiver cannot do this. Children and adolescents grow through play and exploration. And so what we say at the program, fun is fundamental. Put the fun before the mental. We continue to inject oxytocin via hugs, via soothing words, because we know we're tackling and we're fighting against um, our, our sympathetic system, which has been on high rev from we've been including and increasing in our gun violence in Jamaica at this time. So this brings me to the close. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you for Tia, Miriam and Ocean for setting the context to this important process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott and students for that um, for that presentation. And thank you so much, Danielle, for that fitness break as well. Patricia has worked with at youth risk before and has seen the problems that crime and violence raise, especially in impoverished communities. While she has not been a victim of this itself, having her own child constantly gives her fear that she needs to protect her daughter from the evils of society at all costs. This is all part of her paranoia diagnosis. We have just heard about some of the challenges that can impact our physical and mental health outcomes. As we shift our focus to addressing solutions, we invite Ms. Daniel Walwyn, and AUA medical students Katerina, Taha, and Victoria, with support from Ricardo, Pearl, and Tivia, to highlight how and why we should be creatively investing in physical activity 
to prevent and control physical and mental NCDs. Ms. Walman is a certified fitness instructor with nearly a decade's experience in getting people of all ages active and continues to be invested in co-creating meaningful school-based health promotion interventions with colleagues across the Caribbean and Canada. Danielle, over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Sobers. The benefits of physical activity for both physical and mental health are irrefutable. Yet globally, almost 500 million new cases of preventable NCDs will occur between 2020 and 2030 if there's no change in the current prevalence of physical inactivity. Nearly half of these new cases of NCDs will result from hypertension and 43% will result from depression. Treatment costs for NCDs just from physical inactivity alone could be just over 300 billion or around US 27 billion annually. Given that the Caribbean has one of the highest rates of NCDs in the world and hypertension and depression in particular are on the rise, this is cause for concern. Unfortunately, we have insufficient physical activity data in the region, and the statistics that I'm about to present are to be taken with a grain of salt, given that anecdotally we know that there have been shifts in physical activity over the course of the pandemic. But 2016 data shows that 20% or more of our adult population across the region is not meeting the WHO physical activity guidelines. That is that they are not getting the recommended 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a week. Unfortunately, our children are in a worsened situation with physical inactivity being more common among girls than boys. Research that I would have done in Antigua and Barbuda among adolescents would have indicated that girls' barriers to physical activity are unique and our approach must respond accordingly. Sedentary behavior is also on the rise. However, we don't have data that truly captures this in the region, but I think we can all say anecdotally, we know that people are sitting a lot more while at work and play. However, I want us to remain hopeful because if we do shift our approach and integrate physical activity more meaningfully across all sectors of society as encouraged by regional efforts like Caribbean Moves and amplify its diverse roles in controlling and managing NCDs, violence in our communities, mental health and well-being, we will see the benefits. Katerina will expand on these proven benefits of physical activity across the life course to emphasize its importance as a solution for both physical and mental health. Katerina, over to you. Thank you, Danielle. So I'd like to begin with addressing the difference between physical activity and exercise. There is a stigma that exercise is a physical activity everyone needs to do, but physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that results in energy expenditure. Exercise is a subcategory of physical activity that is planned, structured, repetitive, and focused on improvement of the components of physical fitness. The different benefits derived from physical activity depends on the elements of the fit principle. F for frequency is how often we exercise, I for intensity is at what level, T for time is for how long we exercise, and type for what could be an anaerobic versus aerobic. Physical activity is recommended to all ages with benefits ranging from reducing depression to improving the risk of blood cross mortality and decreasing the prevalence of SCDs. Physical inactivity is the key risk factor for NCDs and the fourth leading cause of early death globally. People who are fit and have other risks for cardiovascular disease are at a lower risk of premature death than people who are sedentary with no risk factors at all for CBD. The recommended amount of physical activity for adults is 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous activity, and for children, it is 60 minutes per day. A study done showed that physical activity was as effective as medication for prevention of diabetes and CBDs. Weightlifting and other strength building exercises can increase muscle mass and strengthen bones. Children can benefit from this because it decreases injuries and fractures during sports activities. In one study, it was concluded that the primary cause of sports injury was poor physical conditioning in these children. The elderly can benefit from strength building exercises by reducing instability, falls, and fractures. Training programs are found to prevent or reverse almost 1% of bone loss per year in the lumbar spine and femoral neck, specifically in pre and postmenopausal women who are at a higher risk due to decreased estrogen. 
Physical activity can also reduce the incidence of breast cancer and colon cancer. To tie in some biological mechanisms, physical activity improves endothelial function, which decreases risk of plaque buildup, atherosclerosis, and coronary artery disease. Physical activity can enhance lipid lipoprotein profiles, improve glucose homeostasis and insulin sensitivity, reduce blood pressure, and improve coronary blood pressure. Physical activity also has a beneficial impact on mental and neurological disorders. Some of the immediate benefits include keeping thinking, learning, and judgment skills sharp as individuals age throughout their lifetime. It has also been shown to improve academic performance in children. Physical activity can also reduce short-term feelings of anxiety for all ages by providing a sense of social reinforcement and mastery and providing an improved response to stress through reduced muscle tension and heart rate. A reduction in depression is also a benefit of physical activity. A study done showed that exercise prescription is also as effective as medication for treating depression because it can improve self-image and confidence due to body weight improvement. Physical activity resulted in risk reductions of up to 50% in cognitive decline and dementia in later life because it can be neuroprotective by maintaining adequate blood flow to the brain and stimulating brain cell growth and survival. Overall, we can see that physical activity has many benefits over an individual's lifespan, ranging from decreasing risk of NCDs to improving mental health and overall improving quality of life. Back to you, Danielle. Thank you, Katerina, for expanding on the benefits. And I guess we can really see how, again, beneficial physical activity is across the life course. So in attempting to increase physical activity, we must also be mindful of our environments. In health promotion, we really aim to shift the focus to shaping a person's environment to better support their health. One model that we often reference is a socio-ecological model, which considers the relationship between an individual and their environment and how their environment impacts their health. Taha will highlight the unique circumstances in the Caribbean and how we could leverage these in approaches to increase physical activity for improved physical and mental health. Taha, over to you. Thank you, Danielle. A growing amount of research has been done to explore different aspects of Caribbean contents that may affect the physical activity. The research thus far originated most, mostly of Barbados and Jamaica, has highlighted the impact of many factors, including cultural norms and the physical environment and the policy level factors may have on physical activity behaviors. I'll, I'll briefly highlight the findings of a few studies and their potential impact on an improving physical activity levels regionally. Social environments for physical activity through strategic planning and building safe environment and transportation lane use policies can enhance physical activities. The excellent exa example for physical environment falling under the social ecological model is the example of Jamaica. A study done by Coonham Meyer and colleagues highlighted the importance of creating safe public spaces in Jamaica and the, 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 the impact it can have on increasing physical activity levels. In this study, the system of absorbing play and re recreation in communities model was used to obtain base baseline data on park usage pattern. In-depth interviews used to gain insight into the park's usage for physical activity were also completed with park users. The findings which highlighted park usage by sex and age, as well as perceived barriers and facilitators can be used to inform policy and guide the development of similar parks across the region. For example, the park was used significantly more by female, which is often a less active group, and the walking track was the most commonly used feature of the park. In efforts to get different physical activity, activists, inputs, and impact following the social ecological model under community environment. Components, the, the getter, the getting getter um, meeting is a good example for this. The meeting gathered different sectors of different environments so they can merge their collaboration and ideas. The recommendations were to develop public adult place spaces car free days movement to encourage the, com the communities to be active and also encouraging doctors officially to prescribe exercises 
and educating on the mental and physical activity of the physical activity. Finally, ensuring that children benefit from the physical activity in schools, not just top athletes, and the need of encouraging parents to recognize that physical activity can enhance academic performance. Policy environment is an essential component for the social ecological model. Regional experts collaborate to evaluate the policy response to non-communicable diseases in seven Caribbean countries with a specific focus on addressing unhealthy diet and physical inactivity to better support physical activity and, and nurture interve interventions and the regional experts recommended was better regional collaboration and policy support across sectors to accelerate the pace of action to support healthy eating and actively uh, an, an active living environment and the development of a whole society policy blueprints to better facilitate the approach and also the use of regional N ncds campaign to encourage the physical activity. And Ms. Walwyn will speak further on the whole of society approach soon. I would like from you to close your eyes as I paint this image for you. I want you to imagine you live in a small community. From the moment you walk outside, you notice an uneven and cracked sidewalks, making it difficult to walk or jog without the risk of tripping or falling. The parks have poor lighting and filled with litter and broken glasses, making it unsafe to play sports or exercise out outside. The streets are congested with traffic, making it dangerous to ride bike or even walk. The environment around you is poorly built and for physical activity. As a result, if you find yourself staying indoors and being inactive, you may gain weight and feel less energ energized and motivated. Now compare that to another wall where you walk outside to a char charming place filled with parks and protected sidewalks, crosswalks, and bike bicycle lanes. Your fellow residents are healthy and active, and they love to spend their time outdoors, exploring their town with plenty of open spaces and safe and easily accessible. As a result, you notice more people are feeling, are looking fit, healthy, happy, and more people of all ages out and about being active and social as community. Now you can open your eyes. Now in comparison, in the first space, spaceship to the second picture, physical activities, places, and arts are very impactful, and the life of a person involved in physical activities can depend on these factors. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you, Taha. I think we can all work collaboratively to help realize that letter, latter image that you described. So now we're in a position to delve a little deeper into solutions that Taha would have alluded to, given that we appreciate the benefits of physical activity and have some insight into critical research and conversations that have already been had about physical activity in the Caribbean. In 2018, the World Health Organization released a global action plan on physical activity with an overall goal to reduce physical inactivity by 15% by 2030. And the action plan outlines key policy asks that fall within creating active environments, active societies, active people, and active systems. Victoria and I will speak about a few of the evidence-based solutions that have been proposed by regional and international experts focused on two policy areas in particular, active systems and active people. Victoria, over to you. Thank you, Danielle. Addressing mental health and more broadly, non-communicable diseases will take cooperation from all levels of society. Given our low resource settings, it is important for us to consider how we can increase physical activity opportunities through existing interventions to better support mental health. The school is a prime location to increase physical activity opportunities for children and adolescents. The Port of Spain evaluation report indicated that simple strategies like mandating physical education could be highly beneficial for promoting movement and by extension, mental health and well-being. The Port of Spain evaluation and the WHO also emphasized the need for bicycle lanes and sidewalks to better support active transportation. In addition, efforts should be made to improve public transportation to, to decrease the reliance on personal vehicles. And lastly, 
and our planning, we should ensure that populations that are known to be least active, including girls, women, and those living with disabilities, have access to physical activity opportunities, which are by extension opportunities to improve their mental health and well-being. These suggestions are in no way a one-size-fits-all answer, and all interventions should be informed by those who have lived experience. Overall, it is imperative that all age groups, regardless of current health status, replace sedentary activity with physical activity of any intensity for any opportunity to have access to both the mental and physical benefits associated with this activity. Thank you, Victoria. So active systems reference the elements needed for effective and coordinated action to increase physical activity and reduce sedentary behavior. One of the key recommendations to increasing physical activity is implementing a high level whole of society coordination mechanism. And we're lucky because we already have this system in place in the Caribbean through NCD commissions. Fun fact, Barbados's NCD Commission is one of the oldest in the region and just welcomed a new chairman. Over the course of its existence, the commission has had representation from the ministries of health, agriculture, education, research institutions, sports groups, health insurance agencies, and the like. Ongoing efforts should be made to introduce or revive these NCD conditions to effectively and holistically address NCDs and their risk factors. Regional experts noted that a success to the commission is ensuring that it contributes to policy development and that persons with lived experience, as well as sectors like physical activity, mental health, climate change, are represented in program development, execution, and monitoring. Further, another system that we haven't strengthened enough to support physical activity is the healthcare system, specifically primary healthcare. When a healthcare provider observes nutrition issues, they're able to advise and then follow up with community nutritionists in most cases. What about in the instance of physical inactivity? A 2021 regional study examined the most effective ways of increasing physical activity given our unique context that Taha would have spoken to. The findings support numerous interventions, including integrating physical activity assessment and counseling in primary healthcare settings as an important part of increasing physical activity. It is noted as a WHO Best Buy for addressing NCDs and recognized most recently in the WHO promoting physical activity through primary care toolkit as a key strategy that can generate a cost effectiveness ratio of 1,000 to 5,000 per disability adjusted life years averted in low and lower income countries and 500 to 1,000 per disability adjusted life years averted in upper, upper middle and high income countries. Yet, brief interventions like physical activity, counseling, and prescription referral of which have been found to lead to a sustained uptake of physical activity have not been implemented. There is growing interest across the Caribbean, especially in Barbados, with a few physicians attempting to mobilize their colleagues and physical activity experts in the community, but even they acknowledge that there are some barriers to implementing physical activity and counseling, which are echoed by research from across the globe. And specific barriers include a lack of training by physicians in medical school, which often translates into a lack of confidence and knowledge, a lack of ownership of the intervention and lack of time. And secondly, lack of community-based support to fulfill the physical activity prescription. But given its success in European countries and growing awareness of existing challenges and potential solutions to address the known implementation challenges, Physical activity assessment and counseling strategy should be a consideration in our Caribbean context, as its implementation implications apologies could significantly contribute to the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. Further, evidence-based comprehensive national policies should be developed and implemented to support healthcare system changes needed to support this intervention. The intervention also needs to be included in our universal health coverage dialogue. And so as we approach World Health Day and major high level meetings, including the high level small island developing states meeting in June and the UN high level meeting on universal health coverage, it is important for the region and for all of us to think strategically as we're doing today about our approach to NCDs, as we note that siloed approaches are not resource efficient. And really, we have no other choice but to think creatively and invest in double and triple duty actions to address NCDs. From our end, this requires the whole of society mechanism to ensure critical sectors are at the table when discussing NCD inter interventions. 
again, including those with lived experience and persons who understand the co-benefits of one potential solution, like investing in physical activity and its implications for human and planetary health. Given the pressing sustainable development goal deadline and the urgency needed to address NCDs and our general mental health and well-being, the question at one of the questions at the forefront of our mind should be, how can one solution tackle as many problems as possible? And physical activity with many co-benefits can result in many opportunities for improved health for all. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sobers, back over to you. Thank you so much for that, Danielle and students. Patricia has always been a physically active individual. An avid sporter in her youth, she played netball and hockey. She was also a dancer from the age of three. Patricia once loved working out. The gym in any sporting arena was her solace. Now that Patricia has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and by extension, prolonged postpartum depression, which is her most recent diagnosis, she does not have the energy or strength to partake in the simplest of activities. Sometimes this makes her fearful that she is selling her daughter short. This segment of the symposium will focus on the economic aspects of mental health disorders, and MHDs, in the Caribbean. In this presentation, we will explore the available data on the cost and economic burden of MHDs and why these represent major health and development concerns in small Caribbean countries, strategic investments to spend more but spend smarter to slow down the impact of MHDs on the health and economic well-being of individuals and countries as a whole, the findings from a modeling study in Jamaica, a small Caribbean country, which showed that enhancing investments in controlling MHDs represents good value for money, that is, the likely return on investment is highly positive. The presentation will be shared by three AUA team members, led by Dr. Stanley Lalta, a visiting faculty lecturer. Dr. Lalta is a health economist with over 30 years of experience in teaching, training, and consulting on health financing, universal coverage, and health and development concerns in the Caribbean. He will be supported by Mr. Mark Knizovic Mara and Ms. Erda Saka, medical students who are enrolled in the global health track. Just before this, uh, we're gonna have another health break, uh, health fitness break, sorry, by uh, Ms. Danielle Wallin. Hello everyone, so we are heading into movement break number two, and this one we're switching up a little bit. We're still going to be using one of my favorite rhythms, a rhythm near and dear to the Caribbean, soca, but we're going to be doing it a little differently than our first one. So we're going to be doing three different movements, all relatively simple, so I'm just going to be here demonstrating, and so you can follow. And after we finish each movement, we're going to have a little break, a solo breather, so you can just keep the feet moving before we start up the new movement, okay? Are you ready to give it a try? Do your little check-in again, see how you feel, and we'll check in again after.
Well done, well done, everyone. How are you feeling? You can let us know in the chat. Awesome job. Just a reminder that you can integrate these at any point in any meeting, conference, anything. Remember, every move counts. Kudos. Enjoy the rest of the program. Hello, good morning. Bernie, am I allowed on? <clears throat> you definitely are, Stanley. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just touching my breath. Um, after that activity, I think I enjoyed it too much. Um, good morning to, uh, to everyone. Uh, this presentation is looking at some of the economic aspects of mental health disorders. We've heard presentations from the other panelists. And uh, how do we put this in economic terms? Why should we be worried from the economics point of view? Uh, the presentation was researched and uh, prepared by a team of us. Uh, we have Udo, Hanno, Mark, uh, Pradit, and uh, myself, and the presentation itself is going to be shared. I will commence with the first part of the presentation, looking at the, the main challenge. Why should we be worried? Why should we be losing sleep over this problem of mental health disorders? Uh, the second part of the presentation will be picked up by Mark, and he will tell us, so if we're worried, what can we do about it? And it's not just doing something about it, but doing something in a way that we can get value for money. You want to spend more, but you want to spend better. So how should we target the programs? And to give us a quantitative analysis as to how a program could be designed for implementation, then Erdo will come in for the third part of the presentation to tell us about the case study of Jamaica. And then I will come in with a very quick wrap up of all of this. Um, just to review, just to remind us that these are the range of mental health disorders we're talking about, um, which generally has been already covered. Uh, why should we be worried? Well, there are four main reasons why we are worried, not just from a health point of view. Uh, morbidity, disability, premature mortality, quality of life, all of these are main leading indicators why you should, we should be worried. But really, from the health point of view, mental health disorders, leading causes projected to increase. And it's not just a problem for rich countries, it's also a problem for poor countries. Not just a problem for rich people, but also for poor people across gender, across rural and urban centers. So it strikes at everyone. Another major dimension why we worry is really this, that we've only touched a part of the problem. There, there's a great proportion of persons who have not been diagnosed and who are not getting access. And therefore, what we see now in front of us is only one part of the bigger problem because of this gap in coverage. The third major reason why the concern is that, look, mental health disorders not just have major health implications, but they have major economic and cost implications. And I'm gonna give you an idea of some of these. And it's not just looking at this from a national or a country point of view. You can break it down as Kim, as uh, um, Joanne have broken it down to individuals. You can break it down to families. You can break it down at the community level and you can begin to see the huge economic and social cost. But, but the fourth part, and which is where economics add value to what we want to do. There are solutions which can be targeted, integrated, and if we take the right action, the right time, scale up properly, we could actually get real results which show a very cost-effective way of spending money and that provides a very high rate of return. 
What do we measure by cost in economics? Generally, we look at what's the cost of treatment, of prevention, of caring, rehabilitation, hospitalization, surgery. We call that the direct cost. And many countries can easily measure that. What is more difficult to measure is the indirect cost. Because persons may be out of a job, die early, retire early, can't even get a job, then production will fall, productivity in the workplace is likely to fall, and we can measure all of these, refer to these as the indirect cost. The third set of costs are really the social cost, the cost of stigma, of not showing up for treatment, of suicide, of school dropout, of caregivers at home who have to stay at home to look after family members who uh, have some mental disorder of homelessness, of crime, delinquency, drug abuse. All of these can be what we call the broader social cost. But the reverse, the reverse side of all of this is that if because of the prevention, the treatment programs that we want to implement, then we could avert some of these costs. We could reduce the burden of disease by 10%. If we can reduce some of these costs, how much is that going to cost us? How much because of these programs are we going to save lives, lead to more healthy life in the population, improve quality of life in the population, reduce the amount of suicide, school dropout, keep people in jobs for longer periods? These are what we measure on the reverse side as the benefits. So really what economics tries to do is that it is quite good to have good ideas, good intentions, uh, good suggestions, but let's begin to specify, quantify, measure these so that we can make it a bankable program. And that's what we want to look at because what we're really saying is that if we do this properly, we're gonna get a good return on investment. And we looked around, we pulled out the data on the cost, and we can look at global cost. Um, with 11 to 18% of the population having a mental health disorder, one in eight persons. In 2010, it cost the world about $2.5 trillion, or 12 billion working days were lost because persons, persons with mental health disorders. Generally, over this period, it has been estimated, uh, the World Economic Forum, it's going to cost us about $16 trillion in lost output. Now, that's economic output, which is lost because of persons having mental health disorders. If, however, we spend properly, then you can see that there's a positive rate of return, 3%, 5%, 6% rate of to return, meaning that for every $1 that you spend on a corrective program, you're likely to get five, $6 as your rate of return. And that's a very healthy, very positive, very bankable rate of return. But countries have been spending a very small amount, which is what the WHO found out, that just about 2% of health budgets are spent on mental health. And in low and middle income countries, it's even less. In the US, the UK, Canada, where also measures have taken place as to what are the cost. Um, there are different measures, different ways, different techniques of measuring cost, different levels of comprehensiveness, different time periods which have been used. So you have to make adjustment for all of these when you want to compare like with like. And generally in the US, we can see what the cost was in 2009 and what it was estimated is gonna cost them in about uh, uh, 2020. In the UK, they lose, they lose about 5% of their economic output because of having to deal with mental health disorders. In Canada, they lose about 3% of their economic output. And you can see the amount of money that is involved. In the case of the UK, in the case of the UK, they also did a rate of return. If we were to put positive corrective programs in place, then what's the rate of return? And you can get up to $15 for each dollar spent 
on a corrective program. That's real value for money. So economics is not just measuring the cost. Economic is also trying to quantify. So what is going to be the benefit if we can put the right corrective programs in place and therefore we can find out the rate of return and tell those with the money, the banks, the governments, the business places that investing money in mental health programs represents a good spend or good value. In Antigua and Barbuda, where we collected some data, the data is very limited, but government spends just about 7% of the budget on health. And the majority of that goes to the single psychiatric hospital. Is this the best way to spend the money? Or do we think that probably money spent in the community to treat mental health conditions, that may be a better way of spending. So what's the alternative? And economics tries to compare these alternatives and begin to tell us what's the best way? What's the best approach? How can we do better? We want to get more money for mental health, but we must be able to spend it better. Let's quantify, let's pin down what we want to do. And Mark will tell us about some of these programs, some of these approaches we can adopt in order to do more and to do better with mental health programs especially, especially in small, low-income, middle-income countries, which cannot afford high-cost institutions, which cannot afford high-cost hospitalization, which cannot afford high-cost medication. What are the real alternatives we can get that will still provide value for money? Mark? Thank you, Dr. Lalt. Hello, everyone. Okay. So as we dive into the cost of mental health illness and the lost economic productivity, it is important to focus on investing more into mental health, especially in the lower and middle income communities. Over the long term, and as you will see in, the, in a case later on by Erda, this investment will provide a greater return of investment or ROI due to increased economic output as a result of increased productivity such as having a lot less call-outs from work due to a mental health illness, for instance. As you have seen previously, the direct healthcare costs surrounding mental health are astronomical, costing over 2.5 trillion in the US alone directly. This does not include the indirect costs, such as the, the loss of work productivity. Here we go through some solutions to consider economically speaking to increase mental well-being within all communities. Next slide. One solution to consider is to provide tax incentives to private businesses to focus more on, pre on preventative care versus reactionary care. The idea would be to encourage employers to seek health insurance schemes which include mental health coverage, as well as to extend more preventative measures for mental health care, including screening and counseling. The long-term benefit would be increased work productivity, which would in turn cause a greater economic output and thus a greater return on investment. Another idea features utilizing a more collective community-based approach to healthcare, incorporating social care in addition to medical care. This approach would extend access to more people, especially in lower income communities, as opposed to focusing on the individual care, which may not be accessible and is costly. This collective approach will include more money invested into prevention and mitigation, that is in detecting, screening, and counseling people with their mental health. Likewise, it's also important to focus on the follow-up care, as there are many barriers to continuing care, including cost and access. It will be important to focus strongly on improving follow-up and accessibility, whether it's through technological platforms, including telehealth and mobile devices, or establishing more accessible and convenient locations for follow-up within the local community. As we expand this coverage, part of the large investment will require additional training of skilled personnel to manage the influx of people seeking mental health screenings, follow-ups, and treatment. Improving access and affordability to underserved groups is paramount to a healthier economic system and population. 
We need to provide targeted care to rural and inner city dwellers by increasing the use of telehealth and mobile devices, as well as to offer more convenient options for follow-up, including at-home visits by skilled professionals for those who may be disabled or may not have access to travel. Utilizing the healthcare system alone is not enough though. We have to incorporate all aspects of the community, including support to caregivers, as well as faith-based organizations to educate and promote mental wellness and decrease stigmatization of this illness, especially here in the Caribbean. In addition to faith-based leaders, incorporating other stakeholders is also very important to address the social determinants of mental health. We need to ensure our educators are on board to help in decreasing stigmas, as well as encouraging people to get screenings and seek treatment. We also need to make sure that people who are in need of treatment do not lose their housing or employment, especially to those in lower income communities who live paycheck to paycheck. People need to feel safe to know that if they seek treatment, they will be able to get back to their daily life without having to worry about employment or housing. Lastly, the same principles apply when we consider the social care aspect and being able to deal with substance abuse concerns when it comes to securing one's housing, employment, and food. Stakeholder support is critical to incorporating mental well-being into daily living. And now I'm going to pass it to Erda, who's going to speak on an example of the current initiatives of the mental health investment in Jamaica. Thank you. In Jamaica, there has been a rise in the number of individuals seeking treatment for mental illness. A study started in 2019 features an investment to control depression, anxiety, and psychosis. The prevalence of these conditions in the population is 3% for depression, 4% for anxiety, and 1% for psychosis. To manage these mental health conditions, we have many treatment options available. For mild cases of depression and anxiety, Patients can benefit from education about mental health conditions and techniques to address psychosocial stressors, reviving social networks, engaging in structured physical activity programs, and regular follow-ups also can be helpful. More intensive psychosocial interventions can be used for moderate to severe depression or anxiety along with depression. These interventions include behavioral activation, relaxation training, problem-solving treatment, interpersonal therapy, cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy. In some cases, medication, such as antidepressant, may be necessary to manage moderate to severe depression or anxiety. Therapy can be continued either on an episodic or maintenance basis, depending on the individual's need. Episodic therapy focuses on treating acute symptoms or as, as they appear, while maintenance therapy is continued after a treatment of acute symptoms to reduce the risk of relapse. Managing mild psychosis can be effective by educating patients, their caregivers, facilitating rehabilitations into the community and providing regular follow-up care. More intensive psychosis, it can be helpful to have family therapy, social skills therapy, timely and adequate antipsychotic medication. In addition, there is a need to have regular follow-up appointments to assess symptoms, side effects, adherence to medication, and routine laboratory monitoring. Next slide, please. The figures I'm about to present are in Jamaican currency since the currency exchange rate changes often. Currently, there is no consensus on the impact of psychosis. For that reason, we estimate the economic value of the health gains solely from the healthy life years gained. The study aims to reduce the burden of mental illness and improve overall health with a project return on investment of 4.2 Jamaican dollars for every dollar invested. It addresses psychosocial and pharmacological interventions related to depression, anxiety, and psychosis, with a total projected benefit of 60 billion Jamaican dollars, which is greater than the previous cost of 14.2 billion. The return on investment increases steadily every year for all three packages. When the return on investment is greater than one, it indicates financial gain from scaling up treatment. By prioritizing mental health and investing in these in interventions, Jamaica has had a positive impact on the quality of life of its people. As we can see, the benefits are greater than the cost. This study will contribute to, to gross domestic product growth, improve overall well being, and move towards universal health coverage and the right to health. Thank you, and back to you, Dr. Latla.
Thanks very much, Mark and uh, Pedro, for those uh, uh, aspects of the presentation. The crucial things coming out from that, and if I may, as part of my key messages, the crucial, the crucial aspects coming out from that may be summarized in this cube, what we call universal coverage for health, coming out from sustainable development goals. And really, you want to make sure that by focusing on mental health conditions, as we indicated at the beginning, it's a major problem. But even within that problem, you have a whole number of persons who are not diagnosed, who are not being treated. You want to ensure that the first dimension, population coverage, is broader than what you have now. So we call that first dimension the proportion of the population with mental health conditions who are covered. So we scale up a program to cover more and more persons. The second dimension of all of this is what are the specific services we want to cover? As indicated, if we try to focus on hospitalization, on specialist treatment, on medicalization only, then I do think that we're going to run into major problems, especially in small or, or low middle income countries. And therefore, this is where Mark's take on how do we have more integrated community-based type of services? How do we ensure that we bring in other players into the marketplace, like the business firms, so that they can invest some of their money rather than thinking that everything has to be handled by governments only? How do we get the private banks involved in all of this so that it becomes a private enterprise at the same time, rather than thinking it is only government responsibility to fund the money? And this is where the third dimension of all of what we want to do comes into the mix. That is part dealing with the financing. We want to make sure we cover more people for the range of services that we're targeting, but that we have enough money to do it. And those are the three dimensions. If we can get right, then we're on the road to managing with targeted programs to showing that trying to solve the problem of mental health disorders is not a pie in the sky. It can be done. Jamaica, with its case study, has been pointing out the quantification and how you can measure the cost and the benefit of the program. And that's what economics tries to bring to all of this, a sense of quantification, a sense that if we do it right, we can show that there is great value for money in targeting investment on mental health disorders. And that's the substance of what we want to do with our presentation. Thanks to Erda, thanks to Mark, thanks to Pradit, thanks to Hannah, who've assisted with all of this research and preparation. Over to you, Verni. Okay, so I'm gonna invite uh, the key messages to be shared uh, now. Hello everyone, my name is Pearl Mary. I'm a first year medical student. And since we've already heard everybody speak, I'm now gonna go over some key messages that we can get from this presentation. Number one, the uncomfortable truth. The Caribbean region faces many interlinked challenges that worsen NCDs. The Caribbean has the highest rates of premature deaths due to NCDs in the Americas. Our childhood obesity epidemic puts our children at even greater risk. Persons living with NCDs often also have poor mental health. The converse is also true. We are highly vulnerable to climate change, which worsens NCD and mental health outcomes. Access to mental health services and NC care, NCD care is limited. Countries throughout the region have been very slow to progress towards targets to achieve NCD reduction of 25% by 2025. The pandemic has further impeded the process. Number two. Whole of society action is needed to comprehensively address NCDs. The pandemic has shown our capacity to quickly respond and adapt in the face of imminent danger. A whole society approach is critical to addressing physical and mental NCDs. 
national mechanisms like the NCD commissions should be implemented or strengthened and ensure an active role in NCD policy and program development. Academia help neutral private sector entities such as financial and insurance institutions, civil society organizations, and those with lived experiences among other stakeholders should be represented on these national commissions. Investing in health promoting behaviors like physical activity and good nutrition should be recognized for the impact on both physical and mental health. Policies to support positive behavioral change need to be implemented, including introduction of increased taxes on sugar, sweetened beverages, alcohol and tobacco, secured spaces for lactating mothers to express and store milk once they have returned to work, and improved access to fruits and vegetables from backyards, rooftops, the workplace, schools, and local farmers. The Caribbean needs to increase its capacity for research so that the success of introduced policies may be closely monitored and approved as needed. Number three, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis cause preventable chronic physical and mental disease and disability. Co-use of these have adverse synergistic effects. All sickness of death resulting from their use is preventable. Children and adolescents are a high risk group. Myths about their safe recreational use need to be dispelled. Policymakers must make the hard decisions required to restrict access and promote awareness of harms. Four, trauma is an unrecognized driver of NCDs. Traumatic experiences have been shown to have long-term impact on the development of chronic NCDs. The burden of mental and behavioral disorders in traumatized children and adolescents can manifest as mental disorders and maladjusted behaviors, including social withdrawal, aggression, and suicidal tendencies. Mental health services for children and adolescents is inadequate and should include adjunctive psychosocial support through sports, physical activities, and cultural arts to facilitate healing. Frontline workers that engage with youth beyond the health sector, including guidance counselors, teachers, police, coaches, social workers, camp facilitators, and church leaders need additional support for their own mental health to be able to cope with the increased high levels of maladaptive behaviors in the context of trauma associated with increased crime and violence and compounded by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the two-year period of students being out of school. Five, mental health disorders are costly, but can be addressed with community-based interventions. Mental health disorders have major cost and economic implications for all countries and all social groups. This is even more acute in small developing countries like the Caribbean, which have limited resources to roll back the burden of mental health disorders. These small resource poor countries need to spend more, but spend smarter on controlling mental health disorders. Emphasis has to be placed on prevention, early detection, and community-based actions since the rate of return on investment spending is highly positive. And lastly, Youth want mental health to be protected and destigmatized. The youth in the region have called for more media campaigns to reduce mental health stigma and improved access to mental health services. Greater access to mental health services at the primary care level through government and private partnerships. Mental health services should use a gender equitable approach and remove other youth identified barriers to accessing care. But at an even more basic level, our communities and our homes should practice consciously to protect the physical and mental being of our children. Focus on focusing on the simple things that we know can protect children and adolescents at risk. For example, the building pillars of resiliency, having caring relationships, and providing opportunities for meaning, meaningful participation for our children. Our children's health is everybody's business. With we will achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 3.4, which is a reduction in premature mortality by one third due to NCDs by 2030. Thank you for your attention. Okay, <clears throat> uh, in this presentation, we've looked at four key facets of NCDs in the Caribbean. We have also introduced our own case study, Patricia, and I think it's time we actually meet Patricia. So hello, my name is Verne, and I am Patricia. Yes, I was diagnosed with my first disorder at the age of 11, 
Mental health issues can indeed start at a very young age, as we would have seen with Dr. Scott's presentation. While I am a walking living example of persons who hide their illnesses well, might I add that this journey has not been easy. From years of insomnia to complete de depressive states, I have somehow been able to pull through every child with the help of amazing family and friend support systems. Every single presentation today has spoken to some aspect of my journey, from the family history of diabetes and hypertension to some, of, to some form of substance abuse, leading up to uh, the idea of resiliency and how resources need to be directed, that persons are given the help that they so desperately need. My family has a long history of diabetes and hypertension as mentioned previously. From my grandmothers on both sides to my parents, NCDs are an, an unwanted staple in my family. I was not diagnosed until 2010 with diabetes and then in 2012 for hypertension. As much as I tried for years to stay a bit off, it finally caught up with me. Obviously at this time, I was already diagnosed with depression and had been on medication since I was 13. I did not go on insulin until 2014 and before then had a topsy-turvy wave of the highs and lows of type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Dr. Walwyn and her students pointed out so excellently the effects these type of NCDs have on the Caribbean community and by extension based on our history, the Black and Indigenous communities in the Caribbean. While substance abuse did not play a huge factor in my journey, I still use substances. At, uh, as much as my drinking and smoking started off as something social, I ended up later in my walk uh, smoking a bit more and drinking a little more. Um, albeit all social, but then again, I used to go every uh, weekend. When I had my breakdown in 2020, at the start of the pandemic, I found myself on the beach, cigarettes in hand, burning myself and thinking about walking into the ocean and never coming back. I was blessed to have the psychiatrist that I have. When I called her crying, she knew exactly what to say and do. I spent the following week in hospital and it was then that I made the decision as to what I wanted my short-term goal to be. That was motherhood. I was able to keep substance abuse in any form um, at bay during my pregnancy, even though I struggled with intrusive thoughts and unwanted feelings. I had and still have a great support system, something that most mothers are not afforded. While I have experienced my fair share of trauma, the idea of resiliency follows me everywhere I go. Despite all that I have been through, I have been able to obtain my bachelor's degree with honors, my master's with merit, um, I collaborated a, on patented uh, social theory with colleagues from both Howard and American University. I lectured in my expert areas at UWI Cave Hill. Um, I volunteered in numerous programs and exercises. And now my ultimate dream, outside of being a mother, uh, as a, of being a health, mental health advocate, something that obviously I hold dear to my heart. Each day is a struggle. But somehow through the entire process, I have been able to achieve. I see myself as a prime example of living with rainbows in my clouds. Well, working out is something that I love to do. I struggle with the effects of bipolar depression and prolonged postpartum. Depression hurts a lot. It tears and wears your body out. I want us to be mindful that physical activity is extremely important when dealing with NCDs, but also know that sometimes the mind is willing, but the body is not. As Danielle and her students would have pointed out, there are so many feel-good effects of physical activity in dealing with mental health disorders and overall well-being. I hope that we continue to push each other to be active. Funding as it relates to NCDs is not just uh, about where the money is spent, but how it is spent. In Barbados, I was not aware that we have free mental health clinics until I was 32 years of age. I struggled to pay my private psychiatrist as well as get medication, which led to years of 
on and off again medication and on and off again therapy. I mentioned previously that I did not know that here in Barbados with our free healthcare system, that we have free mental health clinics. That's crazy. If myself, a person who has been battling, who had been battling the disease for 21 years at that time of finding out, did not know the treatment options available. Imagine persons who still don't know to this day. 25 years in total of diagnoses and 23 years medicated. That's a lot of money, especially when there are times I wasn't sure where it was coming from. Great support system, yes. But an independent girl who didn't like to ask anyone for help because her pride allowed her to suffer too much, that's me. And still is me to some extent. At the end of the day, our aim is to make sure that the funding is directed adequately, that all of our natives to the beautiful archipelago that we call the West Indies can find peace in knowing that they do not burden the healthcare system, but can aid in prevention to keep the prevalence of NCDs at bay. Thank you so much, Verne, for sharing your powerful story and weaving in all of our concepts together um, that we've had for the day. So at this point, having heard from everybody, I'm actually going to invite any questions for just a few minutes before we close off. You can put your questions into the Q&A box if you have any, or into the chat box. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions, but I'm therefore gonna move on to my thank yous. First of all, thank you to the AUA leadership, um, Dr. Bell and Dr. David Graham, who have been incredibly supportive of the Global Health Track course, and of course, of our students. Jane Mandovan leads marketing overall. She's based in New York. She's been powerfully supportive along with Sharon Brush and Kamon Drago, making sure that all of you, our audience, actually got an invitation and that you could register with us today. I have to also well thank you Report. Um, you Report, we know, is a subsidiary of UNICEF and you Report OECS joined along forces with Let's Unpack It, Mental Health Talk Antigua, Healthy Caribbean Coalition, and Healthy Coalition Youth. All of you have been incredible in supporting our journey to find out more what the youth want so that we can actually share this with everybody today. And hopefully policymakers are here listening and we're making an impression. At the very beginning of our presentation, we heard the voices of persons who actually live with NCDs. I am totally thankful for them for being so vulnerable and open to share their experiences with us as to how they felt when they first got diagnosed. Dr. Arlen Seaton, who's a graduate of AUA, but a phenomenal musician, has actually done the splicing together so that we could hear their voices. Mrs. Verne Sobers, who graciously agreed to be our moderator today and is, as you can see, a content expert, not because of her education alone, which is amazing, but also because of her experience that she's had living with NCDs. And we thank her as well for sharing her phenomenal and outstanding process as she's come all the way through her life through to today. Ms. Danielle Walwyn, who did our physical activity and also is the link that got us through to your report OECS. We thank you profusely for everything that you've done for us all the way up to today, Danielle. All of the content experts who have worked tirelessly with me from the time that I thought and conceptualized of this topic, the incredible support of Dr. Brathwaite, Dr. Kimbella Scott, Ms. Danielle Walwyn, and Dr. Lauta. Thank you all for working with the students and making sure that we delivered like we did today. Of course, none of this is possible without our incredible students who signed up very early in January for this process and have been working tirelessly week after week, digging away, finding the research, and then finally some of them, a handset of them, many more behind this, but a handset, a handful of them actually came and presented with us today. And of course, I can't um, forget my right-hand Candy Harry, who's the administrator behind all of this, running around making sure that we're all okay. 
I am really touched to see that our audience is so full today, and I'm deeply appreciative of all of you. I know that the general public has relevance because as Pearl said, our future is everybody's responsibility in order for, achieve, in order for us to achieve 3.4 before 2030. But thank you as well to any policymakers that might be present, anybody in any aspect of government, and also in um, private sector, as well as all of the other sectors involved in health, which is pretty much all of us. I actually do see three Q and A's. And I don't see any questions. <laughs> All right, everybody, I'll be open for another few minutes. We have four more minutes before the end. And I will wait to see if there are any more questions, but a huge kudos. I don't know if anybody else, um, any other members of the panel would like to share a word or two based on our, today's experiences. Again, a profound thank you to all of you. The recording will be shared with participants and the slides of the facilitators can be made available. And thank you, Faye, for your participation. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Yes, Bernie. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> Not sure I'm raising my hand, but um, I put it in the chat for them, but I just wanna say um, once again, I'm thanking everyone for this opportunity. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Braffitt, for reaching out to me. Thank you so much, Leslie, who will not allow me to call her Dr. Walman, um, for this experience. And I love to take my advocacy wherever it can lead me because our voices do need to be heard. But coming as a uh, speaking as a former lecturer, I just want to tell the students, kudos, you guys have you guys have, have done so great. You, your confidence at Duda today, I hope you guys know you are well on your way. I support you and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And I just wanna give you guys your props. Okay, I think without further ado, unless there are no, no other questions, I'm gonna say a tremendous and humble thank you to every person here today, in particular to my students, in particular to Verne, in particular to the persons who shared their personal experiences, and in particular to the content experts. Without all of you, none of this would have been possible. To my audience, I really hope we've made a difference in the way you perceive mental health going forward, and that collectively we may have an all of society approach going forward to improve overall care and the reduction of our NCD stats and NCD pre-mortality related stats by the year 2020. Thank you, everybody.